a large number of characters have gone missing during A Song of Ice and Fire and in the histories. Missing is a word with a wide variety of meanings, though, and we're going to try to apply as many of those definitions as possible. Tyrek is an example of a straightforward missing person. Well, Taisha is missing from the narrative. Well, she's included, but we haven't seen her on page. She's only been talked about, thought about, etc. Whether it's a character whose location we simply don't know because they're elusive, like the Blackfish, though we do have a general idea. Or because we, they might be dead, like Benjamin Stark. We also have a general idea of where he is, but <laughs> it needs to be narrowed down quite a bit. Or both, like Stone Snake, who's also beyond the wall. We'll cover the details of their absence and their outlook in that regard as to whether they might be found, what that might mean for the story. Some have run off on their own accord. Others maybe seized against their will, and others, well, we're not really sure. There's also the matter of characters that appear to be missing to other characters within the story, even though we readers know where they are. Like Arya and Sansa and Rick, all the Starks, basically. <laughs> in fact, most of the major characters have been missing at one point or another, and a lot of them still are. So this episode is dedicated to those characters, large and small, prominent and obscure, who have been on the pages but don't have known locations or certain known locations, let alone fates. We've got all that and more on this episode of History of Westeros podcast. You know, one thing that is missing. What's that? Sean. Sean. We don't have a Sean today. He is missing. That's right. We thought we'd add to <laughs> the vibe of this episode by having one of our own be missing. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nothing strange about that. Sean will be back uh, next week and um, everything will be normal. But yeah, this week, no Sean. Uh, but we do live stream almost every Sunday at 3 on YouTube. You can catch the video anytime after that. Still on YouTube. Or you can catch it. Later on Spotify, usually takes a few days to a week to get put up, and the video is edited when it's on Spotify, as same goes for all the podcast versions, but you can also hear them without ads if you listen on Patreon or if you listen on the Spotify Patreon feed. This episode is brought to you by Topics Moot 2024. That's right. It's the fifth of the episodes chosen by History of Westeros patrons during the voting period, which was February of this year. And will be February next year and the year after. That's our plan anyway. We'll see how that goes. We've been really excited about the topics chosen so far. This is no exception. This is a huge episode. We have a 30-page document. And the, the downside of that is we won't be able to focus on any particular character all that much, but we'll be looking at a lot of characters and going through quite a bit of comparisons between some of them. Anyway, I won't spend too much time saying what we're going to do. Let's just do it. Uh, thanks to our good friend, Nina, goodqueenally.tumblr.com. She had a lot of thoughts on a lot of these characters. Some of them are, of course, near and dear to her heart like they are to mine and a lot of yar yars? Y'alls? <laughs> and, of course, that gives us... That means we have headcanon and theories on some of the ones that we particularly are interested in or we thought about a lot. So that'll be fun. Unfortunately, what's not so fun is the episode dedication that we'll make right now. I have some bad news for y'all. We lost... A great member of the community, Stephen Atwell, passed of cancer not too long ago. We're very sad. Uh, he was an incredible contributor to the community and to other fandoms and to social justice. He was a big uh, believer in, in labor and getting jobs for everybody. He was a professor and was well known for his academic writings. Uh, most of you maybe only know him for his A Song of Ice and Fire writings, but he's also was big in the X-Men fandom. He had a podcast. Yeah, his last episode released was on X-Men 97, his last guest appearance. Yeah, so, you know, people thought, we thought he was doing pretty well on his recovery, but, well, that's cancer. Screw cancer. Yeah. Okay. So this episode's dedicated to him, and I am sure that he, his presence will live on in the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom because his writings are so good. He's been in, what, eight or nine episodes eight. of History of Westeros? I looked eight? it up. Okay, you counted. Thanks for counting. Yeah. I knew it was a lot. And A uh, lot of our Blackfire Rebellion series. That's the huge, main one, huge yeah. Huge portion of that. So Nearly you, every episode yeah. of the Blackfire series he's in. 
And his writings will be cited for decades, I'm sure of that. Uh, not just to the Song of Ice and Fire fandom, but his writings in other places as well. He's a very, very talented writer, and his words will live on. If you have questions for us, if you have missing characters that we didn't think of, which is very, not just possible, but likely, because there's so many, and because I said that we're using a very broad definition of missing. So yeah, it is wide open. I asked a lot of y'all to weigh in ahead of time. I posted this in our Facebook group and our Discord, and I got a lot of great answers. So you'll see that as we go through. And at the end, we'll have a big list of episodes that relate to this one (laughs) because we're touching on so many different characters that shoots a lot of tendrils and feelers in a lot of different directions. So that creates a lot of uh, crossover with, with episodes we've done in the past. Also at the end of this episode is the answer to this trivia question, which is Rhaegar Frey is the son of Aenys Frey and the younger brother of Aegon Frey. What did Rhaegar Frey in turn name his own firstborn son? If you recall, Rhaegar is the one, one of the three Freys that went into a pie. So I say is the son of Aenys. He was the son. I guess he still is. But Aenys is also dead. <laughs> we don't know about this Aegon Frey, though. It's not Jingle Bell. And in fact, this Aegon Frey will be mentioned in this episode. So more on him later. Like I said, some of these characters we'll discuss briefly, a little others more deeply. Some will need an introduction because they're kind of obscure. You may have forgotten who they are, or maybe they have the same name as someone else, like like that last one. There's two Aegon Freys, right? <laughs> so sometimes we'll need to sort out who they are. Others are as major as you can get, like Arya, as I said, and Sansa. These are hidden, missing characters. But So their circumstances we won't have as much to say about, but we'll still talk about what they have in common and the purpose of their missingness. Nina adds that one important thing to keep in mind when we're trying to think about whether a character who's gone missing is going to return, whether there's a, we have to think about the narrative purpose there. It's not just, we can go a little too far in thinking about this as a living and breathing world, which is George has done such a great job of making it feel that way, but it still is a story. And we have to keep that in mind that it wouldn't necessarily make sense for some of these characters to come back. Now, that said, we're not George. We don't have his imagination. We don't always know what makes sense. So we're going to be thorough with some caveats saying, well, this character, we don't necessarily think they're going to come back, but maybe we're wrong. So what's cool and what makes sense is something we have to kind of balance as we're going through this. Let's start beyond the wall. Yeah, let's go right to Benjen. (laughs) Benjen is our first missing person. Uh, He's one of the most prominent missing people. In fact, well, he's also like the first missing person, arguably Waymar, Royce, and Will and Garrett are considered missing, but we know all, we know what happened to all three of them right away, right? Garrett go, shows up south of the wall in chapter one after the prologue. Ned executes him. The kids find direwolves. You all know that chapter. John eventually looks forward to coexisting with Benjen Stark. He decides to take the black, talks to Benjen, tells him he's ready to to join, but none of that ever happens, right? John gets to the wall, says, hey, I want to go with you. And Benjamin's like, are you kidding me? You have no experience. All the men going with me have lots of experience. Good for John that he didn't go because obviously Benjamin doesn't come back. Two of his companions return as whites. And of course, two more searches go out. So Benjamin was going on a search for Waymar and then Dywin and Hake both go on separate rangings to find him and fail and then the Great Ranging goes out to find him. It's one of their goals. It's not the only goal of the Great Ranging, but of course it doesn't accomplish that goal. And as we discussed in our Craster episode, there's reason to think Craster lied about Benjen, about seeing him, and that adds to the mystery, the possibility that that Craster knows something. And, you know, it's, it's by the way, a little narrative trick there as well that twice <laughs> we're teased with the possibility that John will have a close member of his family on the wall with him, right? Because Ned's also supposed to take the black before Joffrey and, and probably Littlefinger screw that plan up. So there's two different points at which it looks like John will have a family member as his companion, and neither time does it actually happen. So as crucial, all this is crucial to the early setup, though interestingly, the, the Night's Watch plot kind of stays on its own. It's, it's separated from all the other ones, even when John tries to go join them in the South. He doesn't get very far, so it's not really that connected. But then it just becomes suddenly connected to everything when Stannis just appears at the end of A Storm of Swords and is like, whoa, all right, this just became a very much a part of, of the War of Five Kings. And 
he's so he's Benjamin's an example of a character who's both missing to us and the characters in world. And he's been missing. And this has been true for the entire length of the series, minus the very first few chapters. And it's really hard to believe this will never be resolved. But it's also difficult to imagine that he's alive. And I put that in quotes because what exactly does alive mean? Well, I, I don't mean a normal functioning human anymore. He could be walking around as undead, some version of cold hands, but not cold hands, of course. But it's, yeah, it's been three years. Like it, it, you may, y'all may not have put that together, the actual length of time that he's been missing. So that's a lot, a long time. It's not impossible that he's alive, but geez, three years beyond the wall without any word from him. It doesn't look good. Like, wouldn't he have sent word? Wouldn't he have come back and said, hey, I found something? Why is he still out there if he's not inhibited or alive? You know, th these are tough questions to answer. Nina says, I fully believe he'll return in part because John's biological parentage is an issue here. He might have answers there. He had a strong relationship with Liana. It was someone who may have helped her bend or break the rules because she was kind of all about breaking rules and, and, and going outside the drawing outside the lines. Whereas Ned, not so much, which is a clue to Benjamin. When Ned comes home with a child that he claims is his bastard. Well, I mean, we're assuming he didn't tell Benjamin the truth, which is a pretty safe assumption. He never told Catelyn. Uh, it's possible he told since Leon is his sister and that's a different thing. But regardless, <laughs> Benjamin's not going to believe it. He's not going to be like, oh yeah, my brother, Ned Stark, <laughs> the one <laughs> who believes, you know, follows the rules. Is he really going to have a bastard? I mean, we don't really think that's a fit for his personality. Right, Ashea? Like Benjamin? Yeah. <laughs> don't even look at me, though. Uh, speak to me. But right. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it, it's so true. Like, this is just, a, there's too many blatant things that Benjamin, we got to put ourselves in Benjamin's shoes. He knows what what uh, what his brother's like. So, you know. Also, there's a chance Benjamin was the one who left that obsidian at the fist of the first men. So, yeah, that's an important point. Our next character is one of Corrin's group. Another ranger, another one lost beyond the wall, Stone Snake. This was a popular answer when I asked people what missing characters you'd like to see us talk about. The reason he becomes missing is his horse dies. He's with the rest of the group with Corin and John and all them. Uh, his horse breaks his leg. They have to kill it and use it for food. And he can't keep up with them without his horse. There's just no way. And he first he volunteers to ambush them. He's like, well, I'm doomed. So why don't I take a few of them out and give you guys some more time? But this is what Corin says in response. If any man in the Night's Watch can make it through the frost fangs alone and afoot, it is you, brother. You can go over mountains that a horse must go around. Make for the fist. Tell Mormont what John saw and how. Tell him that the old powers are waking, that he faces giants and wargs and worse. Tell him that the trees have eyes again. Now, you might think this is just Corrin giving him a confidence boost, like pumping him up, saying, look, no, you have a chance. But it doesn't seem like that's how they behave. These guys are hard and honest and don't mince words or soften truths. Consider Squire Dalbridge is left behind to stay and hold the pass. He does volunteer to stay, or they volunteer him, and he's, he's like, yep, I'm the right man for the job. It wasn't a futile gesture. It did buy them time. So we had another example of one of them sacrificing themselves. However... Corn didn't think Stone Snake should do it. He thought, actually, this guy has a chance to survive. It wasn't futile. So, of course, it's not a sure thing that he survives. But, again, it wasn't like a shot in the dark. There's a legit chance he could make it. John, however, as Stone Snake is leaving, thinks he has no chance. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. But, John, that's his first ranging. He doesn't really know. I mean, maybe he's just fatalistic about that. Now, think about this. It says, go to the fist. Corrin tells him to go to the fist. If he went to the fist, well, that might have gone poorly, given all the whites that were there. But he managed, he might have managed to, like, see that, you know, scout it out and be like, whoa, I better avoid this area. Or perhaps everything had already moved on. Maybe the battle had already happened and there's no whites, nothing there. Now, he would get there to the fist of the first men in this scenario and see no bodies because the all the dead rangers would have been raised again as whites. And of course, the whites that were slain would have maybe been re-raised. I'm not clear about that part. But yeah, it seems like they would have just picked back up again or I don't know. The, in the 
bottom line is he would see evidence of a battle and and very few bodies or just some body parts maybe no whole bodies and that would be chilling that would be like oh my god and well wouldn't he wouldn't we have seen him by now like benjin it's like well why hasn't he come back now he hasn't been lost nearly as long as benjin but it's a long time that he's been lost but would we have would we know if he came back he's not a castle black ranger if he had come to castle black yeah we'd have known that that would have been announced but Corrin and his group were from the Shadow Tower. So if he had gone back, he might have gone back to the Shadow Tower, which we wouldn't necessarily know that, right? He could have shown up there and they wouldn't necessarily send a, a letter to Castle Black saying, hey, by the way, Stone Snake came back. They might have. They might have communicated that because he might have had things to say. But it's not a sure thing. And yeah, and they're very remote. The, the, the Shadow Tower men... I think they're the toughest of the rangers of the Night's Watch because of their location is so remote and dangerous. And it's the oldest part of the north, right? So it's like the most, I don't know, dark and supernatural potentially. There's more cannibals over there, the, the tribes that we know less about. It's just, it seems harder. <laughs> so not only is he a great climber, but John says internally, he's never known a man with better night vision. Furthermore... Rattleshirt tells Mance in front of John, right? They're talking about who John was with and all this other business about Corin and, and who died and all that. He says one of the Rangers they had been pursuing got away by climbing up into a place they couldn't follow. Clearly that's Stone Snake. There's no other person it could have been. So Rattleshirt's people did not catch Stone Snake. There's no, they explicitly say they couldn't get him. That's a good sign. When John is climbing the wall later as part of Igrit and the Magnar of Then's raiding party, he thinks of Stone Snake again. This is a whole book later. He's like, this is tough. This climbing stuff makes him think of Stone Snake, right? So even though he's arguably vastly less important to the narrative than Benjen Stark, there are good reasons to believe his chance of survival is greater than Benjen's. He's a better survivalist, probably. And he's a better climber. We've got word of him more recently. You know, we don't have the whole, well, he would have come back to Castle Black part. Now, there's the caveat that characters beyond the wall have other ways of returning, you know, like as walking corpses or something to that matter. So I'm talking about returning alive. This is good. This could be a good example of George's gardening style. Even though gardens aren't so popular beyond the wall. Haha. <laughs> I mean that George might decide he has a reason for a stone snake to be alive or worth bringing back into the story. He might not have fully fleshed out what that purpose was when he had stone snake run off. It's cost him a few paragraphs to describe this character leaving to follow up on him once or twice. And that's it. It's just a few sentences, a few lines of dialogue. That's it. It's not, it doesn't burden the narrative to keep him, you know, in our minds just a little bit. And that little bit has done a lot of work, hasn't it? We've, he's, like I said, he was one of the most popular characters for this episode. So George may not have re decided what the full purpose of Stone Snake was when he had him run off and, and survive. He might be like, well, now, I, but later he might be like, okay, this is a good pr chance to bring Stone Snake in for whatever reason that might be. Does, he's witnessed something beyond the wall. He has, well, it's probably something like that. Is he's witnessed something. But, or maybe he just wants to bring him back because we would cheer for that. We would be like, it'd be a good thing to give to us readers, like a a shot in the arm for like so many tragedies are happening. It's like, hey, but Stone Snake is back. All right, cool. That's one win. Our final piece oh. of evidence. What's that? Oh, did you say something? I, oh, no, sorry. I thought you said something. I, well, I did. I was trying to say something. Yes. Okay, sorry. I was saying that Nina points out that it's worth noting that in every subsequent appendix, Stone Snake is specifically listed as not being dead, whereas Squire Dalbridge and Egan are specifically listed as dead. Personally, she sees so Stone Snake. She sees Stone Snake <laughs> as a potential POV character for a prologue of a Dance with Dragons, which uh, you mean a Dream of Spring? Oh yeah, <laughs> a Dream. Of We've already had a dance with dragons, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's cool. I need to re-say that. Go ahead. She could very much see Stone Snake as being a POV character for the prologue of a... Di I almost did it again. 
<laughs> for a dream of spring, which I would say means she thinks he's going to die. Oh. <laughs> pretty much all the prologues <laughs> that are, are, yeah. are What have you done, Nina? <laughs> involve death. You could sign him to death. Dang it. No, well, that's well, that would be better than him being already dead. But no, that's true. Maybe George will twist that uh, narrative. We've talked about the possibility of him using that as a... Breaking that pattern. He set us up to think, oh, all these characters are going to die. And then one of them doesn't. And it's like, oh, isn't that nice? So I'm holding out hope for that. So if, if Stone Snake specifically lands, and actually, I'm probably going to root for whatever character is in the prologue to be like, maybe this one won't die. Maybe this one won't. It'll be like, it'll be like uh, watching, rereading the, the Oberyn and the, the mountains. Like this time he'll, this time he won't screw it up. This time he's going to, I'm going to read of it. It's going to come out differently. The final one would be the one that makes sense to break the pattern. That's true. It's a dream that, of spring. It's everything's a little bit more positive. You know, if he breaks the pattern and wins a winner, and then then we'll really be wondering, like the last one will be like, is he going back or is this the new pattern? What's it going to be? Yeah. I, either way, I'm I'm very curious. So, like that. Uh, moving on, more Night's Watch characters. That's right. We're staying beyond the wall. We're we're sort of regional with this episode. We're going to kind of stick to certain areas, although. That gets tricky because we don't if, if you don't know where someone is, what area, what region can we say they're in, right? We don't know. But in this case, we're pretty darn sure. We're talking now about Alistair Thorne, Dywin, and Kedge White Eye. Dywin and Kedge are experienced rangers. Alistair Thorne is not, though he is an experienced fighter and you know, experienced guy. He just hasn't gone beyond the wall until now. Alistair Thorne is an interesting piece of the narrative because he's John's first enemy unless you count Catelyn which you might but Alistair is specifically like the last sentence of a, of a one of John's chapters is that you know when he said in the acid tones of an enemy you know so <laughs> it's a small it's a small start like Arya's worried about Septa Mordain and things like that where the challenges grow a lot larger really quickly John's bigger enemies of course are the undead but in this case, you know, Alistair Thorne, Dywin, and Kedge all might become undead. So, mm, yeah, that might be right down the middle. Thorne is, of course, a former master at arms for Castle Black. And he was in opposition to the Starks. He was a Targaryen loyalist. He stayed loyal to Ares. So that is part of the reason why they had these problems in the first place. Before Mormont sent Thorne south, though, then he was, this is how he, of course, he took care of the issues between him and John. And then when he came back, he was still John's enemy, but as a subordinate to Jano Slint, rather than as the main antagonist, right up until Slint lost his head for blatantly disobeying orders. Thorne claims John is sending him out to die by sending him on a ranging when he has so little ranging experience. And he, I don't think that's the case. I don't think he wants him to die, but it might be punitive. Um, there are definitely more experienced men he could have sent. And that's who he did send to lead the raging parties. It's not like these men, like I said, these these. It's not designed to fail, but it, it was a curious choice to send Alistair out there, and it did, did feel maybe a little bit vindictive or, or something. Anyway, Dywin is the one who can smell cold and has wooden teeth. Uh, he, like he I said crime? earlier, what's that? Can he smell crime? He can smell crime. <laughs> he goes searching for Benjen as well, like Hake, but at least he returns. And this is notable because he's very good. He is perhaps the best tracker in the Night's Watch. Chet when he's getting ready to pull his murder escape thing in the prologue of A Storm of Swords, he specifically thinks they have to kill Dywin because he's one of the guys that will, will catch them. They'll send Dywin after them, and, and Dywin's too talented at, at tracking. So they got to kill the guy that's going to find them. And he's an experienced veteran. He knows almost everyone on the wall, which is an interesting factor, like a, a guy who's been around and knows everyone. So we're curious how that's going to resolve. We don't know where he's at, where he's at. He's out there beyond the wall and so far hasn't returned. Kedge White Eye, similar. He's also a very experienced ranger, probably not as talented as Dywin and not a good leader because he doesn't get along with anyone. He's like a misanthrope, basically. He's, his, his eyes are described, one is white and one is mean. And he's a really, really good ranger. They, they describe him that. Except he, just, he just isn't easy to get along with. The guy that you want on your side... But maybe you don't want to hang out with him afterwards. <laughs> but still, so the, remember what happened was, John sent out three groups of three in A Dance with Dragons. One of those is the group of three that are caught and killed by the Weeper, and with their eyes gouged out, and Melisandre has a dream of them. She sees the, the weeping eye sockets and all that. 
Unfortunately, that was Black Jack Bulwer, who was very briefly the f- the new first ranger. I don't even think a new first ranger has been appointed, but that's that's a beside the point right now. And Melisandre has not seen the fates of the other two groups of three. John specifically asked her to read the flames, try to find out what happened to those other six. She doesn't see it. So we don't know. Even her, or even she doesn't have an answer. So remember, Dywin has Alistair and one other guy. And Kedge has two other guys. So there's three other people that are in those two groups. We don't even know their names. But they are, they'd be considered missing too. Alistair has quite a line for John. Quote. You'd best pray that it's a wildling blade that kills me, though. The ones the others kill don't stay dead. And they remember. I'm coming back, Lord Snow. Well, if he does, he won't be missing anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah. And to make it a little more ominous, all three of these groups were sent with ravens. As far as we know, none of the ravens have come back. This isn't like Victorian, where he didn't send ravens back out of spite to make his brother wonder, right? <laughs> he had ravens and was like, nah, don't send them. Alistair might do that sort of thing, but he's not in charge of the ranging, so it's not his call. I really doubt that Kedge or, or uh, Dywin would be like, nah, let's not send ravens back. So it's bad that we haven't heard. Now, if we were going even farther with this, like I said, this is a 30-page document for this episode, so we've got a lot of characters to cover. We really could dig deeper and probably name more free folk in Night's Watch that are missing or that we just haven't heard from in a while. Like those giants and mammoths that are headed to East Watch. We, we mentioned them in the Hard Home episode. For all we know, they made it there no problem and are now on the other side of the wall, but maybe they are now dead and in the army of the others. Hmm. Almost everyone involved in Hard Home could be considered missing in a sense, at least right now, because... We don't have an update on a very quickly developing situation. So, yeah, let's not get too bogged down on... on we have to draw the line somewhere on what, what, what's missing. <laughs> a character that's been mentioned a few times that we've never met is Conwy. Why don't you like, wait, Conwy, that name is vaguely familiar. Who is that? He, he's not actually beyond the wall. He is a member of the Night's Watch, and I'm very curious about him. He's Yoren's equivalent, another recruiter. Basically, there were two recruiters at the start of the sto- sorry, sorry, story, and Yorin and Conway are the two. But we've only seen Yorin, and we saw him a lot before his passing, and, and never seen Conway. So he's all the more missing. He's missing <laughs> from our minds and memories, missing from the page. That's true. He sure is. He's brought up, re- you know, semi regularly because even in A Dance with Dragons, he's mentioned because some of his recruits are there. Like, oh, this was recruited by Conwy. This guy came because of Conwy. So he's still bringing people to the watch at a time when they are desperate for for manpower. Uh, Recruiting could take on a different meaning if the wall falls or if the other others get through it, which is maybe part of why George created this character. He's like, well, there wouldn't just be one recruiter. Maybe he just thought of having more than two, (laughs) but... He clearly had plans for Yorin and, and might have plans for Conwy. He, remember as well, Yorin was replaced by Darian, who also went missing, though we know exactly where he went too, right into the canal. <laughs> and the Faceless Men knew about that too. But apparently that's it. Only the Faceless Men and Arya know what happened to Darian. So I'm very curious to see what type of recruiting, what Night's Watch recruiting looks like when things get a lot worse in the North. Whether it gets more difficult, whether more people are willing to sign up to go fight for humanity or whether it's just a the fight war the war in the south is just takes over everything and people just don't go north because the the war in the south is just all encompassing so there's really a lot of ways it can go yeah well my question is just do people really need to join the night's watch in order to fight this uh you know life threatening thing that's a good point like a lot of the Free folk don't actually join. They just they're still fight effectively. They're fighting alongside. So I think a lot of the people, the southern people, they won't need to be recruited. They won't need to join up because they're just gonna have to fight. Yeah, it's, it's more like it's less of a recruitment for the Night's Watch, less of a recruitment to come help. Just we need the, the North needs you, not necessarily the Watch needs you. Some people might take the black. Some people might be like, yeah, let's just go fight and not join. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Like in the show, we saw lots of examples of that, and I assume that we'll see some examples, if not lots, in the book as well. Let's move on to uh, Brandon Company. Like I said, every Stark is going to be mentioned today because all of them are scattered and in various forms of hiding, if not straight up missing. 
most people think Bran and Rickon were killed by Theon. So they're not actually thinking about them. They're like, they're not missing. They're dead. But there are people who know they're alive, not just us readers. Considering that their lives are in danger, they have allowed this rumor to perpetuate as much as possible. They're like, yeah, it's good that people think we're dead for now. We don't want them hunting us. And amongst the people who are hunting them, of course, are people who do know, like the Boltons, Theon himself, and that Lord Little they encountered in that cave that gave them some oat cakes and, and Bran promised to repay him later, you know. And that Little might have told some other trusted people, you know, that's it's a part of the Great Northern Conspiracy that actually a lot of people know Bran and Rickon are alive because of this Little. And well... Nina, if, oh. go ahead. Nina points out that obviously knowing someone was alive at one point, as in during a storm of swords, does not necessarily mean that that person w- believes that person's alive right now. It's been so, a while. Yeah, yeah, Bran was out in the wilderness without adult supervision. They, I mean, realistically, they a lot of people who thought he was alive were like, he's probably dead. A lot yeah. of them probably think that. Even if he wasn't dead the first time, I was like, well, maybe he is now. You know, you still haven't heard from him in all this time. It's like, where could he be? You know, and he's only going to return when he has to. No one's going to find him, right? No one's going to find him. He's going to return when either events or his choice guides him back to south of the wall and, you know, announces his return, you know. He's currently taking a full course load at Green Seer University. He doesn't have time to, you know, come home or <laughs> let people know he's alive. It's dangerous. So, yeah. And he's not alone, though, right? Mira and Jojen, they're with him. Now, remember, Sam also knows he's alive. And that's even more recent than some of the other people who saw him alive. So there's a decent number of people that know he's alive and could talk. And, and of course, Rickon and Osha know, you know, they split a while ago. They're a good example of someone that, knew that Bran survived the event that everyone else thought he was killed in at Winterfell by Theon, but they haven't followed up in so long, like Ashea pointed out. It's like, well, Rickon doesn't know his brother's still alive. Although he might, thanks to skin changing, warging and the dreams and all that. Like, Rickon knew his father was dead, right? Before Maester Lewin got the letter, and, and Bran had that same dream, so... And John had that one dream at the beginning of A Dance of Dragons where he's inside Ghost and the and Ghost is uh right not, not Ghost rather, but Shaggy Dog. And Shaggy Dog is aware of the other wolves when he's in Shaggy Dog's brain. So there's a good reason to think that apart from Sansa, the Starks kind of have a sense that the others are alive. And this is where John is included, whereas sometimes he's not. Because John's not missing. <laughs> John's the only one who's not missing. He's 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 certainly his fate is certainly up in the air, but he's not missing. So Bran and Rickon, and uh, we'll come back to Rickon, but Bran, yeah, he's he's literally not out of the woods yet, but uh, it'll be super interesting when he reannounces himself, and it'll be part of the Stark succession and the war for the dawn and a lot of big events that are that are still yet to come. But yeah, he's definitely considered missing. Let's go. Let's continue in the north and continue with another Stark. But before we talk about Rickon and Osha and Shaggy, let's let's look at something real quickly that's small uh, George once said way back in the day when people were asking him questions like this is really early on like back when George would respond directly to fan mail <laughs> he once said there's probably some Stark cousins out there somewhere you know they don't they're no longer Winterfell Starks they could eventually trace their like if you go back far enough they could trace their ancestry to Winterfell all Starks trace back to Winterfell but maybe they haven't been Winterfell Starks in many generations. You know, there's other lines out there. So we don't know who any of these people are. George may have decided actually there isn't because he did say probably. He didn't say definitely. He, he, he gave himself some room to, to change his mind on that. I don't know how that would come up. Maybe it's relevant to Endgame stuff, A Dream of Spring stuff. If y'all have thoughts on that, certainly let us know. But it, it was worth a mention because they're definitely missing. They're, we haven't seen them or heard from them. And this is something that George said. It's those car Starks. Yeah, that's who they are. They're car Starks. Yeah. <laughs> and there are some missing car Starks out there, too. Like we said in our episode last week on House Car Stark, there's several like grandsons of, of, of Arnolf and, who were probably sons of Cregan, and we don't know their names. But they're there, and uh, we're not sure where they are. They're somewhere in the north. (laughs) 
So yeah, Rickon and Osha and, and Shaggy Dog, we know roughly where they are, Skagos, but really only a few characters in the story know that. And again, like his other characters, he's kind of missing in a sense, very similar to his brothers and sisters. It is very worth pointing out that none of the conspirators or factions aiming to restore a Stark to Winterfell are aware of any of the other plots to restore the other Starks. Littlefinger, for example, believes that Sansa is the only legitimate Stark left. The Wyman Manderly believes that Rickon is the only legitimate Stark left. Stark's son left. Galbart and Mage believe that Bran, Rickon, and Arya are dead, and Rob named John as his heir. And this may come into play if various Stark factions start moving through White Harbor and hear about the others doing the same, including Rickon with Davos. This is one of those things where it's incredibly hard to figure out what's going to happen because who's going to find out what first? The order of knowledge disseminating through these various parties is impossible to predict and it determines so much of what they will do so let's just say let's just leave it at that and say there's so much happening at the wall and in the north all at once and those two plot and these plot lines are tied to each other with all their various subplots yeah so it's impossible <laughs> but we love to draw attention to it because it's great like we we have all poured over this material so much and there's some things that are just nearly impossible to predict. And that's that's a good job by George. Because there's some things that we, we think we have figured out. Maybe we'll be wrong on some of them. Surely we will be wrong on some of them, and, and we'll be right on a lot of others. But this one we hardly even try <laughs> to make guesses, because it's like, well, who's going to come first? Who's going to learn what first? Rick, is Rickon going to be discovered and immediately tell Davos, actually, I'm not the heir. My older brother is. He's alive. You know, I saw him in my dreams. Are they going to believe him because he's five years old or six years old, whatever he is now? And we're like, listen, crazy little boy. <laughs> we don't know where your brother is. Are you sure he's alive? I mean, yeah, I don't know. There's so many weird things that could happen there. Honorable mention to Davos, too, who is, you know, trying to find Rickon and Osha and Shaggy. He's not missing, but he is presumed dead by his own king, thanks to Manderly's ruse. So there's a possibility of a very fun reunion with Stannis and Davos again, right? <laughs> Stannis already thought Davos was dead once on the Battle of the Blackwater. In fact, T-Wow has the potential to showcase a lot of reunions. Starks with other Starks, Stannis with Davos... Osha coming back, you know, uh, well, we'll see other examples throughout this episode because this is really the topic we're dealing with. People who are missing and the possibility that they'll become unmissing. With Rickon and Toe and with Davos, it, it's like meta undead, right? Like they're not really undead, but it's a bunch of people Stannis and his subordinates thought were dead all coming back at once. Like, oh, Rickon and Davos, what? <laughs> That's crazy. But it's also possible Stannis just dies before getting to see Davos again. That would be kind of a bummer. I would like to see that reunion. There's also some Lysani ships that ran aground on Skane, which is the island next to Skagos. This is according to Cotter Pike's letter to John, right? So this is this is something we talked about in the Hard Home episode. It's entirely possible these sailors will communicate with Davos when he's on Skagos. Remember, we told Davos to pack his bagos for Skagos way back on Valar Ruidus. But he may have uh, some un unexpected company there. And th that's how information from what's happening beyond the wall at Hardhome could pass on to some of Stannis' people. We'll talk about Old Nan and the Winterfell captives. An uncomfortable subject. Easy to miss as well because of how briefly it's mentioned. It's not pleasant to think about. The survivors, mostly women, if not entirely women, uh, are marched to the Dreadfort. Now, this is uh, just like Rob thinking he has to warn Roose Bolton about the Karstark men in his army and how it's really, he's the one in danger. Catelyn tells Roose, or sorry, Catelyn is told by Roose that his son Ramsay has led the surviving women and children there. It's meant to comfort her. And she's like, oh, that's good. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's not good at all. It's terrible. It's horrible. Bran is, is worried about old Dan and some of the others. You know, because they're down in the crypt, uh, hiding. And when they finally emerge, you're like, huh, there's no there's no dead bodies of women here. It's all men. So they notice that 
the women are missing and are able to at least think about that for a minute and make some assumptions. Theon as well, who was there, thinks she's probably dead. And he has this thought in the Dreadfort dungeons. It's an assumption, not something he knows for certain, but sad to say he's heard a lot of women screaming while he's down in the dungeons. There's no... We don't, we're not sure these are the Winterfell women that he hears screaming, but it's probably the case. We do have one example that definitely is. If y'all recall, Theon has this memory in his chapter of, of Ramsay giving him a false escape. The show actually you know, put this on screen, but in the book, it's just something in his memory. And it includes this girl, Kyra. Kyra was a g- girl who worked at the smoking log at the Wintertown. She was a barmaid. And when Theon took Winterfell, he took Kyra as his mistress and treated her terribly, of course. And then Ramsay asked for her when he showed up. He's like, I want my reward. I want Kyra. And Theon was like, oh, you can't have her. You how dare you? And, you know, being stupid like he is. And and that's when Ramsay smashes him in the face and he goes unconscious. So. Kyra's the girl that shows up with the keys in the book version of this saying, hey, we can escape. And and they run off together and Kyra is killed as part of this hunt. And a do- one, Ram- Ramsey names one of his dogs after her. So she's definitely dead. But she's an example of the women at Winterfell that were taken. And she's if, if she was there, then the others are probably there too, still there and in bad straits right now you know one small mercy might be that both Roose and Ramsay are away from the dread fort and have been since the first chapter of a dance with dragons and they may never return i mean we can hope they never return something's gonna happen with the dread fort because if those two both die which seems not unlikely by the end of the series they don't exactly have heirs there's no other boltons out there so we'll have to, the dread fort's gonna have to be sorted out one way or another and that might be when we get an update on these folk uh, I doubt all of them are dead. They know some things. They were witness to the fall of Winterfell. And it would be nice for some of them to survive and have a happy ending. They could learn that Brandon and Rickon are still alive. That'd be nice for them to, to, to hear that, assuming they still are by the time this happens. Uh, there's also survivors from Ramsay's attack um, on Sir Roderick and Clay Serwin. So there might be other people out there that, that were witness to all this. Another thing to consider, though, is that the Dreadfort is farther north than Winterfell. And with both the Boltons fallen, by the time the others come, there may not be any leadership to hold the place. It may just be completely overrun, and that would be a bad fate for all those women down there in the dungeons. Uh, So, yeah, we don't know what's going on. There's no POV at the Dreadfort, no reason to suspect there will be one. So this is something we would have to hear about off page, or maybe they show up back at Winterfell and talk about their ordeal. Yeah, I'm not really sure, but it's grim, but there's some hope. Anyway, that's the the survivors of Winterfell. Just cross your fingers for them and not the Bolton cross. <laughs> Different kind of cross. Let's talk about Hal Mollen, a.k.a. Captain Obvious. He became captain of Ned's Guard after the death of Jory Cassell. He has a penchant for stating the obvious, hence his nickname. He says a lot of very it's it's hilarious actually <laughs> he's he's a bit of comedic relief in a story that's pretty dark he is sent north with ned's bones sort of the honor of being the captain of the guard you get to guard him in death as well but of course he hasn't been seen and of course ned was killed in the first book so there's been quite a while for captain obvious to have made his way north but he has not appeared he goes with three men Quent, Jax, and Shad, which are not important people, but it's a good example of just how much depth and detail George gives to characters that don't even matter, like Quint. It's not the only time he appears. He's one of the guys that wanders off with Theon in the forest scene to chase a turkey, and then Bran gets attacked. So he, sh- he failed to guard Bran. <laughs> and then we have Jax, who was with Ned when he discovers Gendry. And then we have Shad, who multiple times show, shows up as a cook. Like he's with Catelyn when she goes south to treat with Renly. So these are characters that aren't just one scene characters. They're not important. But if you happen to encounter a guy named Quint or Jax or Shad in the neck or in the north, 
think of this moment and be like, actually, we might should know who this is. This is a, a character that was with Captain Obvious and knows things, might know about where Ned's bones are. So he clearly couldn't go to Winterfell. Like by the time he could have even gotten through the neck, Winterfell had been sacked. So he would have paused his journey and maybe been like, well, where do I go? What do I do? And he might just be hanging out in the neck with uh, Hall and Reed with some other characters that we'll mention in a minute. But he might be the hooded man that speaks to Theon and calls him Theon Turncloak. Is that you? You know, he, and he says kind of Captain Obviously things. That's why the theory is that that's him. But I don't really think so because Theon should recognize Hal Mullen. He was a you know important figure at Winterfell that lived there his whole life, and Theon lived at Winterfell for like ten or twelve years, so he would recognize Hal Mullen. So I don't think that's him. But it might be because you know, Theon's been through some stuff and the guy had his hood down. You know, maybe he didn't see his face that clearly. It was snowing. It was dark. There, he didn't have to see his face. So regardless, if that's the if the hooded man in Winterfell is Hal Mollen, we have every reason to believe he's still alive. Remember, Lady Dustin says she's got watchers waiting for Ned's bones. She wants to destroy those bones to feed them to her dogs. She said that in A Dance with Dragons. Three books uh, well, two books after. I guess he goes north in, in A Storm of Swords, I think. E either way, it's been a long time, and he hasn't shown up yet. He's had enough time. <laughs> so he's waiting. He's holding back. And maybe eventually Ned's bones will be laid to rest without interference by Dustin's or otherwise. Mage Mormont and Galbart Glover, we covered them quite a bit in the Rob's Will episode. They were ordered to go there by Rob and to help attack Moat Kaelin, but then the Red Wedding happened before that could happen. So they're like, uh, what do we do now? Remember, Galbart is a lord. He's a lord of, of uh, Deepwood Mott. His brother, Robot, is helping Stannis. Robot's wife and children aren't missing, but they are hostages on the Iron Islands. And they're Asha's hostages, and Asha herself is a captive of Stannis. So that's all. <laughs> this, this could be the way that all gets resolved. Mage is the Lady of Bear Island, too, so they're both rulers. And her daughter, Daisy, was one of those killed at the Red Wedding, so she is uh, has reason for revenge. Not that the entire North doesn't have reason for revenge for the Red Wedding, but it's, it's more personal to her than it might be to, to most of the others. Now, here's where there's another potential missing person or persons. The father to her children. Who is Mage's husband? They joke or jokes. Is it really a joke that it was a bear? <laughs> and it's actually Alisanne, her daughter, who makes that joke. And Alisanne says the same thing about her kids. So <laughs> it's like all it's just the Mormont women cover story. Yeah, we all sleep with bears. That's so. But but still, they're missing from the narrative. Like, who are these? <laughs> who are these men that fathered these Mormont women? We've never met them or heard of them or we have no inkling whatsoever. Alisanne Mormont also tells Asha that Mage is with Two of her other daughters, which are her Alisanne sisters, Lyra and Jory. Yes, Jory is a girl. It's Jorel, and but doesn't say where. But we can be pretty sure it's not Bear Island because it was Liana Mormont who answered Stannis's letter, and Liana Mormont is the younger sister of Lyra and Jory. So, yeah, we don't know if Liana knows if her mother's in the neck either. So some of the Mormonts might know, might not know where Mage is, or maybe they've communicated. So there's a lot of like. Mormont's not knowing where Mormont's are, or do they? Not to mention Jorah being way off in exile. They know he's in exile somewhere in Essos, but they have no idea where. I don't know if they consider him missing, but they definitely don't know where he is. So the person that is probably running the show here in the neck, the guy that has the castle, where maybe all of these people are hanging out, meaning Mage Mormont, Galbart Glover, Captain Obvious with his squad, Ned's Bones, maybe some other people... Hal and Reed. He's missing too. Not that we don't know where he is. We're pretty sure we know exactly where he is, except for that <laughs> problem being that his castle moves. So maybe exactly isn't the right word to use here, but we have a general idea. And it's very interesting that he has not appeared in the narrative yet. He's missing in that. Why haven't we seen him yet? Why don't we know more about him? Uh, George is clearly holding back for reasons, literary reasons, narrative reasons. POV reasons, who knows? I mean, we, we don't have, a, there's no automatic reason we would have seen him by now. But he's also just, like a lot of Ned's memories, they're very compartmentalized. He doesn't think about Liana. 
He doesn't think about Howland all that much. Like, they're barely in his thoughts. There's some way we could have maybe learned more about Howland, the one guy who knew him best, but he just doesn't think about him. So, yeah. And he's probably wondering about his children, right? He heard about the sack of Winterfell. He may have learned that the sack was false. That the, I mean, not false, but that the deaths of Brandon Rickon were false, which might take away some of the anxiety of wondering where his kids are. He might be wondering if they're alive. He may not. He may not. He may be in the dark about what happened to Jojen and Mira. And, um, and who knows what else he knows or doesn't know. So, yeah. But we will meet Howland Reed eventually. So that is something George said. Uh, he said it multiple times that Howland Reed will eventually come into the narrative. So for now, he's missing. We know he's coming. We don't know when. But it's going to be awesome. Like when Howland shows up. I mean, how... Think about your, put yourself in this position, like picture that you're reading, let's say it's a, 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 The Winds of Winter, that Howland appears. You're reading the book and all of a sudden, there he is. <laughs> There's Alan Reed, he's on the page, he's in the, he's saying things. That's going to be so amazing. How We haven't seen this guy ever and we've been hearing about him since 1996. <laughs> Maybe not all of y'all have been hearing about him that long, but that's how long... We've been hearing about Howland Reed as a collective fandom without ever seeing him on page, only having a few direct quotes from him based on things that, that we've been told he's said. But boy, will that be a big one. Talk about a character we've been waiting on for a long time. Let's talk about the Riverlands. Melissa Blackwood, a historical figure, the mother of Bloodraven, who, by the way, went missing from the perspective of Westeros history, but, you know, they haven't really been looking for him. He vanished beyond the wall. We know where he ended up in the cave. Surely we want to know more about that story, how that all went down. But mm, I wouldn't say he's, he's not really missing anymore from, from the point of view of characters in the story. He was. <laughs> when he went missing, I'm sure they looked for him. Well, and when we do see him, well, he doesn't have Benjen with him. Benjen's not in that cave. That's one place that Benjen isn't. <laughs> He also doesn't tell us the tale of his mother and sisters. I don't know why he would. He's got other bigger priorities. Ben, you know, like Bran's asking him questions about his past. But Melissa, in, in her case, we're simply missing a lot of detail. It's, it's more about fleshing out the story rather than thinking she was lost. <laughs> you know, there's a statue of her at Raven Tree Hall in the Godswood. In the Godswood. That's an interesting place for it. The thing is, after she's sent home due to court scandals and, you know, maybe the Brackens getting an egg on the unworthy's ear. She's sent home and we never hear about her again. And she wasn't like old, you know, uh, by any means. She, and she was the most popular of egg on the force mistresses. It was a run of people that were ill chosen. Like he didn't have good taste in women cause he's a bad dude. So he picks bad people for the most part. Right. Uh, but Melissa was an exception. She was friends with Nerys. She was friends with Aemon the Dragon Knight. Like people like that's crazy. Right. The person whose husband, your husband is cheating on you with this guy or this woman. And you, you're friends with her because she's so nice and friendly and everybody liked her. So, yeah, there's a lot of missing characters there. There's several other like great bastards that are arguably they're not called great bastards but really technically everyone that was legitimized by egg on the fourth is a great bastard they just aren't really considered great because they don't do anything you know bitter steel shiera and they're middling a, a, bastards yeah they're middling they're bastards. mediocre bastards <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one so our best guess is melissa died relatively early maybe that's why she got a statue it was a little more remember was more of a tragic figure so popular and you know that's that's what happens when you die too young people are more sad about it you know you live didn't have a life that you deserved so yeah there's there's other characters in this vein that we're going to bring up later but two that we're going to bring up right now Gwenys and mia blood raven's sisters they're both older than him they were legitimized too right melissa and king aegon had these two daughters and we don't know anything about them other than their names not a thing. Did they marry because of their, you know, suddenly boosted bloodline? Or were they forced into the Silent Sisters because of that same problem? Like, well, we, we can't have that. We can't have their bloodline out there. These these legitimate. But then again, like, you know, Bloodraven and Bitterstill, they didn't try to take the name Targaryen. You know, they just went about their business and, you know, continued to very different businesses <laughs> that clashed on the battlefield. But still, 
even Damon Blackfire didn't try to take the name Targaryen, you know. So the whole that, there's a lot of unanswered questions there. To be fair, a lot of them might be answered in Fire and Blood too. You know, there's there's areas where that could get covered, but it's worth mentioning as a current mystery. Jamie Lannister, right? Is he missing? Well, yeah, kinda. And he's quote unquote vanished in the Riverlands, according to what Cersei is told. So all of court is basically in the same spot regarding his whereabouts. They don't know where he is. He's missing. We know where he is. He's in the clutches of Lady Stoneheart after she forced Brienne to lead him into this trap. It's highly doubtful Jamie dies in this predicament, as, as difficult a predicament as it is. But what does it mean for Cersei and the Lannister faction that he's missing? Kevin's just died while he Jamie's missing, which is something that he doesn't even know yet. Uh, in fact, we haven't even seen the reaction from Cersei to that yet. We, that's the last thing in, in The Dance of Dragons. It's the last thing we see, period. Besides the T-Wow chapters, which don't really cover this base. All we kind of know is that Cersei seems to have regained power, given what we see in the Mercy chapter, but mm, even that's a little uncertain. Which, by the way... Fair warning, y'all. There is a few spoilers for the Winds of Winter chapters in this one. Not a lot, but definitely a few. And yeah, so the timing of the trial is really difficult. Cersei's trial and whether Jamie will even know about whether he's going to come back and, and what's going to happen there. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on Jamie, of course, because we have so many characters to cover, but he is absolutely considered missing and uh, by his allies. And it's important. It's a full circle thing for him coming face to face again with both Brienne and Catelyn, the people who have most enabled or kicked off his character development directly and indirectly. Right. And he's rejecting the people who most made him what he is today, like Tywin and Cersei, right? Like the people who were his biggest influences. So of course he has made his own choices too. But when he emerges again from this capture, his second capture, I guess, I, I feel like it will push him farther in a new direction in, in this character change that he's undergoing. And none of this means he can't backslide. He can't bring, come back with some of his old bad habits, nor does it mean he's suddenly a good person. But still, it's indicative of a lot of change. And yeah, I mean, just the trigger for his disappearance alone is indication of a shift. Brienne got him to leave his guards by saying the Hound had Sansa. And he must come alone or he'll kill her. I'm not sure this would have worked on former Jamie. It might have because he's so cocky. He's like, well, let me go. I'll, I can handle this. I can handle anything. I'm Jamie Lannister. But it wouldn't have been because of his duty. He's going now because it was his duty. He took an oath to find Sansa. So his reasoning is very different. His logic, his motivation is very different. And Cersei is absolutely perplexed. It's like, did she really, did he really choose this random woman over me? She's totally baffled. It doesn't even, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jamie can claim later. It's like, oh, I was trying to track down Joffrey's killer. Sansa's Joffrey's killer. That's what I'm doing. But <laughs> his, he won't be telling the truth. <laughs> or will he? We shall see. Anyway, Jamie's missing attitude is pretty important for this plot line. And I think it's going to make him, the person that matters most to it is Jamie himself, I think, even though it's going to have a huge impact on Cersei and the Lannister faction. Speaking of the deeds of Lannisters, let's talk about a character that was at the Red Wedding, Reynald Westerling. That's, uh, he ran to free Grey Wind when the Red Wedding broke out. He clearly wasn't on the, uh, his mother's side, or his, not Sybil Spicer's, not his mother, but he clearly wasn't on the Spicer side of things. He was loyal to Rob, loyal to his, uh, to Jane. He was severely wounded. He got like a crossbow bolt in the gut, I think. He managed to throw himself over the wall into the river. It's not likely he's alive, but George R. R. Martin is way too experienced an author to know otherwise, to, to do something like that and not think we're going to wonder. Like, you, you don't not show the body and expect us to assume he's dead. So this is a seed. Like, maybe he's like, well, maybe I want this guy to survive. It's another like, eh, I could use this witness. I could, maybe he's a, maybe he was there for the Westerling negotiations with Tywin. Maybe he knows some things about the, the pre-planning for the Red Wedding, which might matter. But he's probably dead. You know, he probably just bled to death. It's, it's hard to survive a wound like that. It's not just finding people that can help him. It's, it's It looked like that might have been a fatal wound. Um, But he, if he does turn up, it's probably thanks to the Brotherhood Without Banners. They're the people that are monitoring the situation, if they see a body floating downstream and it's an ally, they would be a not unlikely to save him. 
uh, and he would need substantial time to recover. So there's there's no reason we would have heard from him uh, in the meantime. So yeah, it's possible. And yeah, we'll have to see what happens there. Related, somewhat related anyway, Blackfish. He, of course, wasn't at the Red Wedding, but he also jumped into the river. <laughs> Though at River Run instead of the Twins. And he wasn't injured. So there's almost no doubt he's alive. He's very certainly alive. But... We did an entire episode on him, Blackfish episode. We won't rehash that, the potential for where he might be. Let's just go to say there's a lot of fun possibilities and what might happen when he meets his dead niece is just really hard to figure, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big deal. Funny story, though. Quite a few people have commented on our Blackfish video uh, with mild disappointment because they thought it was the Blackfish documentary, <laughs> which is about the treatment of orcas at SeaWorld. I and, had to rename it. Yeah, it was we were blackfish and I had to make it Brendan Blackfish. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I'm like, whoops, okay, sorry, y'all didn't mean to confuse people about that. <laughs> Another red wedding tangent here is Oliver Frey, Rob's squire. And he was devoted to him. Oliver was a very devoted to Rob. He took it very seriously. He was loyal, etc. And so they wouldn't let him at the Red Wedding. They were like, well, we're not going to keep a loyal squire around. It's one of the clues that something was about to happen. I was like, why isn't Olivar here? Why isn't, you know, what's, what's, what's weird? Duty? They just say duty. He's not here. Like, they didn't have a good lie prepared. So, yeah, it's too late. Catelyn doesn't figure it out until too late. But, yeah. Nina's pretty sure this is where, that Olivar Frey went to Rosby. Because Olivar Frey is a Rosby via his mother. His mother was Bethany Rosby. The only other named Rosby in the modern era is Lord Giles, who just died of his cough. So he's quite possibly who Lord Giles selected to be his heir. But of course, <laughs> Cersei has tried to shove this person aside. And it's never named who this person is. Like, oh, his his ward, you know, the Rosby ward is, oh, that person gets nothing. You know, uh, we'll see if that's what actually holds by the end of the story. I don't know if Cersei's going to have her way. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, this ward has sort of appeared. Um... Felice Stokeworth complains to Cersei about how Lord Rosby's ward refused her and her husband's hospitality, which would be an interesting point if if that's Olivar, because the it was a huge breach of hospitality, the Red Wedding, and so Olivar's like, yeah, we're not, we're, <laughs> we're this is apparently the way we we operate now, you know, hospitality doesn't mean what it used to. And Pycelle points out that the ward at Rosby might have an interest at the inheritance of the late Giles. And, of course, Cersei's like, Cersei actually says, oh, he's not of his blood, which Cersei might, that might be a clue that it's not the, the that this is not Oliver Frey. But Cersei is probably just wrong. <laughs> She's like, oh, that's a Frey, not a Rosby. But, yeah, she'd be wrong. Uh, a, a good chance that Aegon, as in Aegon the Sixth, young Griff, Maybe sort some of this out as a way to, to win allies. He's like, well, I will appoint this Frey in charge of Rosby, and he'll be loyal to me. Right? And that's important because Rosby is just right around the corner from King's Landing. That's a neighbor. You got to have your neighbors, you know, on your side. You can't have them turning on you. That's really dangerous. Speaking of Freys, Aegon Bloodborne. And you might be like, wait, who? Yeah. Yeah. It's not surprising that one of Lord Walder's grandsons hasn't been seen because there's so many of them. Nevertheless, this is quite an interesting fellow we have here. He's the second of Lord Walder's grandsons to be named Aegon, the other one being Jingle Bell, whom Catelyn killed. So he's the only living Frey named Aegon. He is the son of Aenys Frey. That's the one who broke his neck in a pit trap just outside Winterfell. Aenys was the smartest of the Freys in the north. So now uh, it's in the hands of Hostine, who is very much not smart. Aegon's older brother was Rhaegar Frey, the one who ended up in a pie. But Aegon Bloodborne is an outlaw. An outlaw. Not associated with the Brotherhood Without Banners, as far as we know. In fact, he's been an outlaw since before they even existed, as far as we know. We're not sure if he's connected to some existing outlaw group, if he's the leader of it, if he's just a solo outlaw. We don't know why he's called Bloodborne. We don't know why he's an outlaw. We don't think he's been married. It's a very unusual amount of detail, colorful detail, for a character that's never even mentioned. He is technically mentioned, but only in the appendix. So, kind of like Stone Snake is mentioned as alive in the appendix, it, it kind of has some bearing on, on what we believe here. 
He's in every appendix, except for A Game of Thrones. He's in the other four. He probably won't be run into, but it's curious that, that so much detail has been given to him for a character that we might not ever expect to run into, right? It's it's strange. Maybe it's just a way to flesh out the wide-ranging places a huge family will end up when you have so many people competing within a household. Maybe this is a statement on what happens with with all these extras. Maybe it's maybe it is intended. Maybe George planted this seed and just abandoned it. You know, he's like, I don't need this character. But maybe, maybe he'll pop up during the the time of Aegon or well, he is the time. He is Aegon. Yeah. Aegon and Aegon, right? No, it's it's a it's a curiosity. Very puzzling character, this one. But yeah, maybe we'll just never hear from him again. Maybe he'll just remain in the appendix and that's it. <laughs> but or maybe George will Write a whole story, a side story about just this character. <laughs> Special development for just this Aegon Bloodborne. Let's take a few moments to talk about our productivity software rise. Ashe and I have been loving this thing. Again, they are not a sponsor of us. We are, we signed up to be an affiliate of theirs because we are big believers in this software. We use it a little differently, Ashe and I do. I... Just use it to keep me on track. I'm not super detailed with what I'm working on, but the more I use it, the more I'm keeping track of, for example, how much time did I spend writing this particular episode this week? I could go back and look at that and see. So I'm I'm gradually getting more and more into the detailed use of it, and it's making me even more productive. So keeping me on track is the most important thing because I am easily distracted. (laughs) Yeah, and... If you go to rise with a Z dot IO slash U slash Westeros, it's on the screen and use the code Westeros, you can get 25% off your first three months, but you can also enter a giveaway for a lifetime membership. We're closing this on May 1st, 2024. Um, So if you email Westeros history giveaway at gmail.com, you could get a lifetime membership. I'm using this software right now to track the fact that we're having this call. And yes, I do use it slightly differently from Aziz because I also really use it a lot to keep me, um, I also use it a lot to keep me focused, uh, to keep me from using different uh, social media sites and whatnot. Uh, Yeah, all around, I find it indispensable. (laughs) Yeah, we've both been more productive for because of it. We're, that's why we're so excited about it. And we I look forward to even more focus because, <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm not I'm a scatterbrain sometimes. And this has been helping with that. Sit in for Sithies says, Aziz, show me your T-shirt. Yeah, you know, I meant to I meant to show this at the beginning. It's a Sanrixian shirt designed for Joe Magician's channel. And honestly, you know, the Strongs, I, I sort of picked it because it's a great shirt, but also the Strongs have some candidates, maybe. Mostly we wonder what happened to all of Lucamore the Lusty's children. Some of them ended up on the wall. Some of them ended up elsewhere. But that's not a huge mystery. But Joe Magician has specifically tried to track down the Strong bloodline throughout history and where those, which is, includes the descendants of Lucamore the Lusty. So that would count. That fits into today's episode, The Missing. So check out Joe Magician's channel for his episodes on How Strong if you want to learn more about where the bloodlines of the Strong ended up. Another question I have about the Strongs is they have a missing castle. Now, we're not talking about places today, but if we were, they would be nominated for that case because they inherited Harrenhal. Uh, it was given to them, but we don't know what castle they had before that. And they definitely had something because they are considered one of the oldest Riverlands houses. So we just don't know what castle it was. Maybe it's not around anymore. Maybe it was torn down. Maybe it was handed off to a different house. But to date, we don't know. Phil H says, missing are the Kingsguard squires. Always thought it odd they don't really get mentioned. Yeah, there's a few here and there that they get talked about. But you're right. It's it's kind of a not an oversight, but they just aren't talked about. There's definitely... Uh, it's definitely been brought up, though. For example, at the Tower of Joy, you know, when we're thinking about there must have been people there to help take care of Lyanna. There must have been servants. Yeah, there must have been squires, too. The Kingsguard must have had some people to help them, right? They probably just weren't those three dudes without any other men around to help them put their armor on and sharpen their swords. And yeah, it's, it's just super normal to have squires for knights, especially, you would think, prominent knights like the Kingsguard. So, yeah, a little bit of a... A little bit of an absence there is felt. Sticking with the Riverlands, 
The great John, captive of the phrase, you know, uh, captured after the Red Wedding, kept alive. The sigil of a giant breaking its chains has long felt like potential foreshadowing. Now, the reason we're not sure of his location, because all that's pretty straightforward, captured by the phrase and kept in captivity, but... Jamie ordered him transferred to the twins, uh, from the twins to King's Landing, and we don't know if that's happened yet, and if it does, well, that might be the, an opportunity for the BWB or someone else to try to, like, break him out. And Nina also mentions that there's a possibility that the BWB might attack the wedding of Davin Lannister to his fray bride, which... If they do that, maybe that's when the Great John is freed, if he's still in captivity uh, in the same castle where this wedding is taking place. And the reason we might think that happened is, well, that might happen as well. The, the Brotherhood Without Banners has uh, infiltrated not just River Run, but maybe some other places. So we'll see about that. Last week, we also talked about Harry and Karstark as well as Great John. He's at Maidenpool, we think. He may also have been brought to King's Landing. He may have been transferred. Uh, so maybe there's not a big mystery as to where he is, but his family wants to know where he is because he's the heir to Carhold, and so his rights uh, are a big deal, and they're up in the air. You know, who, is he going to live? Is he going to not live? Is he going to come back and claim Carhold? Is it not? So again, we won't spend much time on this one because we talked about it quite a bit in the Karstark episode. But they haven't received any ransom demands either, so it's all from from their perspective. It's it's very puzzling. Sandor Clegane. This one has all sorts of exceptions. To us, you might not consider him missing. You might, though, if you aren't a deeper fandom person and aren't, or don't believe he's the Gravedigger, because we're pretty sure he's the Gravedigger at the Quiet Isle, which means he's not missing to readers. And in world, eh, arguably, he's not missing there either, because most people think he's actively raiding the Riverlands because his helm is still in use. The Hound's Head helm is raiding the Riverlands. Even though he's not the one wearing it, everyone thinks it's him. And it's been worn by several individuals of very low character since the Hound, who maybe isn't a great example of someone with great character, but he's certainly a better person than the people that wore it after him. It's currently worn by Lem Lemon Cloak, who we'll also have mentioned to reason to mention later in the episode. He's not such a bad guy, especially not compared to Rorge, who is about as bad as it gets. But, yeah. Most people wouldn't even care if Sandor was dead, so that's another factor of him not being missing. But his brother wants to know where he is, and the Lan... Well, dead before he was also killed, but... And the Lannisters would want him to answer for running off, but they don't even seem that concerned about it. He's just one guy, they've got bigger problems, and it's an extremely dangerous dog hunt. Like... Who can afford to send all these men after Sandor Clegane, given how dangerous he is? And his crimes aren't that big a deal in the scheme of things. It's not like he's some, you know, claimant that they need to worry about. You know, he's just one man that ran off. So, you know, he gives the Kingsguard a bad name under the Lannisters and, and other things like that. So missing within the narrative is, is it's a little, it's a maybe because everybody thinks he's dead, but we don't. But anyway, I wanted to include him anyway because of all the weird peculiarities of his helm representing his identity, but he's actually alive, but he's not the guy with the helm, but no one's looking for him, but they would if they knew he was alive, but they might not because they might not. He has just all these funny, weird examples here that are kind of unique to Sandor Clegane, which is fair. He's a unique character. At one point, Sandor Clegane insults the Brotherhood Without Banners by calling them brave companions, which gets them so mad because he's he's intentionally comparing them to the Bloody Mummers, the, who, you know, call themselves the brave companions. And, well, a lot of them are still al alive. There's some fugitive brave companions out there. The second in command of Vargo Hote was Faithful Urswick. Jamie tried to con Urswick into, you know, like, look, you guys are doing badly. Get on our side here. And it didn't work. It didn't work. So, Hote kind of went mad you know he got a little power mad with heron hall he, he got that fever when brienne bit his ear off and he'd rather die than give up his castle but I mean, it's very theon like really like i'm gonna go down with the ship uh, at least he had an excuse of a fever theon had no excuse for his horrible decision making but it is a very similar situation here just like theon's men were like this is a terrible idea we're not hyper loyal to you I would much rather live than than go down with this the ship, the castle in this case. And and faithful Urswick and quite a few brave companions also felt that way about Vargo. They're like, why would we stay here and die with you just so you can die in your castle? See ya. 
you know, bye, they left. Uh, and some of the ones that left with him include Zalo the Fat, who is a Dothraki that uses an Arak and a whip, you know, traditional Dothraki weapons. This is the guy who actually cut off Jamie's hand. It was Vargo's order, but Zalo did it. And this is one of the three who tried to rape Brienne before Jamie, like, stopped them. He managed to talk them out of it. And in A Feast for Crows, Jamie still thinks of him. He's like, that Zalo is still out there. I, I need to get him. So he, Jamie hasn't forgotten. Not that he would expect him to, but you know, Jamie is, is once a reckoning with Zalo. He also thinks of Shagwell and Rorge, but those two are dead. Brienne killed them both. And if Brienne and Jamie ever get a chance to sit down and talk, I imagine that will, he'd be happy to hear that she specifically took care of Shagwell and Rorge and separately too. Like they weren't together when, when she killed them, <laughs> but she did kill them. There's also a guy named Tog Joth, who is an Ibanese member of the Brave Companions. We know very little about him, but he's presumably with uh, Urswick, wherever they are. They may have escaped the Seven Kingdoms, but I'm guessing they didn't. And, and there may be some specific people hunting them that we'll mention in a second. There's also a guy named Three Toes, who's some regular dude who is missing some toes, I guess. And he's also just named as a survivor. So these people may turn up if you see them, just kind of like... Um, some of the characters we mentioned earlier, they may show up. This may be a way for George to show their presence. Like, rather than reintroducing Zalo or Urzwick, we may see Tog Joth or Three Toes, and that's a clue that those other slightly more prominent characters are nearby. Sometimes that's how we figure out the bigger names are around, is by connecting the dots to their associates who are more subtle. Technically, though, he's not behaving like a fugitive, and we pretty much know exactly where he is. Kyburn was a member of the Brave Companions and is complicit in many of their crimes and is guilty of plenty on his own. So Kyburn has actually caused quite a few people to go missing in King's Landing in the Red Keep. A very subtle and seen by very few and very disturbing. The BWB had been hunting all of the Brave Companions and they might still want to hunt down Kyburn if they could. I'm not sure they're specifically targeting him, though. I think they would if they, if they could. He's a little bit protected right now. But honestly, Stoneheart isn't that concerned. See, as awful as Vargo Hote was, Vargo turned on Tywin. He didn't turn on Rob. He would have turned on Rob, but he, it never got to that point. He cut off Jamie's hand. Right. So Stoneheart is no fan of Jamie or Tywin. So actually, she doesn't really care about the Brave Companions, I don't think. Uh, she wouldn't see them as a specific enemy. They haven't wronged her cause. And her cause is, you know, find her family and get back those people that, that killed her family. And technically, they didn't. However, many Brother Without Banners left when Stoneheart took over because they don't like her leadership. They see how dark this things have become they don't like what they stand for anymore under barrack they were noble they were helping people under stoneheart it's it's more about accomplishing her revenge goals and finding aria things like that so it's it's different right so let's talk about those other ones those bwb who left in, they are apparently led by edric dane and now they may they're probably not in the riverlands anymore but that's when we last saw them we're told they were headed south a lot of them went south to buy grain uh, and then a different group left. So let's keep them separate. There's the group with Edric. And Edric is 12 years old. He's the Lord of Starfall. Has pale slash ash colored hair. Purple eyes. Squire to the undead. Right? We talked about squires before. <laughs> to the King's Guard. Well, he was a squire to Beric Dondarrion. Even after he was undead. So that's that's wild. He tells Arya about Willa. Who, of course, is in this episode. Willa is considered missing. Now, many supposedly went with Edric. And the only one we know for sure of is Angai the Archer. Good guy to have as an ally, right? Angai is awesome. It's very likely they went to Starfall. Like, why would they not go to Starfall? He has a castle, right? He's like, well, where should we go now? Why not go to my castle, y'all? I have one. I'm like, oh, yeah, you have a castle. Let's go there. It's a, it would be a very welcoming place for the BWB who have been living in caves and, and awful outdoors and, you know, being hunted, you know? Later on, some of them might have been like, you know, we should have gone with Edric. Like, they're probably sleeping in a nice bed down in Starfall, kind of out of harm's way. Maybe they're not in harm. Maybe they are in harm's way, though, because, you know, maybe Darkstar will go down there. We've talked about how he might try to dishonorably and violently claim Dawn. 
Maybe Angai will will stop him. Maybe Edric will stop him. Maybe they'll fail. Maybe Darkstar will kill them or something like that. Yikes. I don't want to see that happen, but it might. Now, we, we've talked before about how Edric was probably planned to be a more important character. So his future is kind of missing in that he was maybe expected to be the Sword of the Morning, maybe expected to be a 17-year-old after the five-year gap. But since the five-year gap was scrapped, what's the plan for him? The outlook for his purpose in the narrative is maybe missing. Uh, those changes to the five-year gap really impacted House Dane. And, well, it's, it's really hard to predict what that will mean. The only other Danes at Starfall right now might be Illyria, and which is why Gerald might make his move. You know, uh, only a, a woman that he thinks he can capture and maybe forcibly marry. He's not married. You know, that might be his way to sort of seize the main branch of House Don away from his, you know, nephew, or not nephew, cousin Edric, and, and of course take Dawn in the process. So... This is a very interesting developing subplot that there hasn't been much reason for George to touch on, but Dorne is becoming a bigger part of the narrative. These things could all tie together somehow when Obara and Ario Hota go west to try to find Darkstar. They might they may find that he already has Dawn and we hear, you know, what happened with that. Or they may go to High Hermitage and find that he's at Starfall <laughs> instead. You know, hold up there at a bigger castle. Like, ah, you know. A lot of possibilities there. Arguably, Gerald Dane himself is missing. I wouldn't go that far. He's he's probably at High Hermitage, and if not, he you know he's probably in the vicinity. But you know, we'll throw him out there as a mention because he might not be where we think he is. So there's a big dangling thread there with Edric and Anga and these guys, and I doubt George will just leave it dangling though. You know, but it is a it is something that is hard to predict. There's this unnamed Tairashi sellsword captain during the Battle of Camps. When Rob's ambush and attack is so successful, he switches sides. He's like, I'm not, I don't have any loyalty to the Lannisters. There's no reason for us to get killed here. Let's, let's join your team. But he's truly missing. <laughs> he and his men, they're truly missing. When George was asked about these guys, George admits he forgot. He just straight up forgot about them. But he suggests kind of on the fly at the time. He's like, yeah, well, what accents I forgot. Maybe we can come up with something right now. He's like, they probably just left. They probably deserted. They probably just took their chance to go home when Rob started raiding the West. They could they started raiding on their own rather than following Rob's plans for it. They just start raiding the West and taking whatever they want and then leaving. You know, just take catching ship to go elsewhere. Back to Tyrosh, maybe. Now, Tyrion claims to have learned some Tyrashi while growing up there. Uh, at Casterly Rock, right? He he grew he learned it from a Tyrashi sellsword. Maybe it was this guy. But it could be this next example, Greenbeard, a.k.a. Pello of Tyrosh. He wound up in the BWB, and we're not sure how. The most likely suggestion is that he fought during the early part of the War of Five Kings and deserted whatever side he was on. George was asked which army he deserted from, and at the time, George didn't, couldn't remember. And it's never been followed up on, as far as we know of. He's big. A large guy, bigger than Lem Lemon Cloak, not as big as the hand, as the hand, not as big as the hound. And his beard is going gray, so it's joke that he's gr gray beard instead of green beard. He does seem like a decent enough guy, though. He's not one of the ones that stays with Stoneheart. And it's kind of what you can maybe draw a line there. It's like the ones who stayed with Stoneheart and maybe a little of the lower quality individuals. Although, you know, to be fair, uh, Thoros of Mir is one of them. But it seems like the ones who don't want to work with Stoneheart are the better, like, more morally upright ones. The ones that, it's, This has gone too far by their perspective. And I, it looks like maybe this Greenbeard guy went with, he might be with Edric. So, but in fact, he hasn't even been around since Stoneheart took over. When they took Sandor's gold, his prize that he won at the tournament, they took, they went south with that money to try and buy food and then come back. We have no idea whether they were successful, whether they actually came back, but it was him and the Mad Huntsman. So the Mad Huntsman could be considered missing as well. The Mad Huntsman's family was all killed by Lannisters, so which is why he's mad. And yeah, so vindictive guy, but um, also doing the right things, trying to help out the survivors and not just focused on his revenge. And this Pello guy, well, anyone who spends their time, their, their time throughout war, concerned with feeding the hungry eh, they're okay by me and i hope we see him again because uh you know the westeros could could use the good guys he seems to be one people who aren't so good 
include a lot of the people that were recruited by Yorin to go north. Yorin's recruits, there's a, quite a few of these guys that we lose track of, and they deserve a quick mention here. Cutjack, Tarber, Merch, Garen, Ureg, and Rayson. Kind of like some of these random Night's Watchmen or other BW beers or the guys with Captain Obvious. They don't have a lot to know about them, but George is careful to give them just enough detail to make them feel like living characters, to make really fill out the story, to make the world building feel more realistic. Merch is the one that yells at Rorge and Biter for mocking a dying woman. He's probably killed by Emery Lorch's men, but we don't see him die. Ditto, Ureg, and Rayson. Garen was wounded. They had to leave him behind, so he's even more likely to have been killed. But all of these guys were going north to join the wall with Yorin. Uh, some of them were volunteers. Some of them were criminals. They, you know, Cut Jack and Tarber survived the battle against Amory Lorch, along with Gendry, Hot Pie, Lamy, Arya, and Weasel. But these are the two that run away. Once they survive the battle, they take everything of value and leave the young people behind. Tarber wasn't much older than them. He was young, but older than, you know, he wasn't, I guess he wasn't a teenager. Cut Jack was an adult who was a former stonemason. Rayson was an older man with a walking staff. Uh, m- most of these guys showed that they were tough. They were willing to stand up to Emery Lorch. Yorin is considered missing by the Night's Watch at this point now. Given, uh, given enough time, they'll consider him dead, and that would be correct because we saw him die. Or at least we saw his body. Maybe Arya will tell John though. Like, they don't know the story, but someone is a witness that is connected to the current Lord Commander. Very connected, Arya and John. So... Maybe he even gets a late memorial. Maybe he gets a burial, a posthumous acknowledgement for his great years, of many years of service. Uh, and these are perhaps among the characters of today that we are the least likely to ever see again. It's almost amazing that I bothered with them. But again, I wanted to show the sprawl. The narrative purpose exists for a reason of these characters. George wants this world to be big. And they are, these are the details that make it bigger. Characters that you can for easily forget about. And they, you know, Tarber does something kind of interesting here. He, which is, makes it worth it to pay attention to minor characters, at least what they do, if not them. He throws acorns in a grave um, so that a tree might eventually mark the spot. It's like an, an organic gravestone, right? A natural gravestone. It's probably a custom that he didn't come up with on his own. This is probably something that a lot of people do. Yet it's the only, he's like the only one we see do it. So he's sort of the representative of this custom within the narrative, within the story. And Cut Jack, at another point, helps dig a grave for the next character's mother. The same dying woman that was apparently Weasel's mother. And Weasel was a girl that never speaks. She stays with Lamy when Arya and Hot Pie try to sneak into the village that the mountain's men have captured. And they want to rescue Gendry. And when they come back, Lamy's still lying there on the ground because his leg is hurt. But Weasel is smartly run off. She also is very symbolic of a lot of other characters that don't have names or faces. And she barely has one herself because we don't know her real name. She's poor and helpless. She's a child who she's she's symbolic of the horrors of war, the impact on the most powerless people. Her trauma is extensive. Like that's why she doesn't talk. We're pretty sure she's probably not born mute, but it's possible. She eats mud. It's a sign of malnourishment, right? That's sad. Uh, But On the plus side, she's also a symbol of resilience and strength through adversity and making it through because that's what Arya considers her. She considers her resilient and stubborn despite, you know, everything going on in her predicament and how she's not particularly capable of much because she's young and and weak and, and all that. But Arya admires that about her and respects it. These are qualities she possesses herself. And it really gets me because I think a lot of us out there have been impacted by people in our lives that we maybe... You only saw them once. Maybe you saw a stranger crying on a subway. Or for me, the one I I think the one that comes back to for me is one time I was in Las Vegas and done for the night. We're going to have a meal. And I just saw this dude just like break down crying at, the, at a table next to us. And his, I guess his wife or his sister or someone was just like trying to comfort him. It's pretty obvious what happened. Most likely this guy just lost a ton of money, money that he probably couldn't afford. You know, it's a pretty regular thing to see at a casino. But for some reason, I just, I I think about this. This happened 20 years ago. Uh, Just a memory that that kind of, I wouldn't say it haunts me, but it's not that powerful. But it's not a pleasant thought. 
So, you know, you might not have context of seeing this stranger melt down or have problems, but you can have that sympathy because you know, well, everyone goes through stuff. Everyone has problems in their lives. And I'm sure that this is a legit one. You know, this is, you can sympathize without even knowing what the problem is. And here we do know what a lot of the problems are. We don't know why she can't speak. We don't know what she went through, but we can imagine it's a war. She's lived through war. Her mother's dead. We saw that, right? That gets horrible. You don't have to imagine much. And Arya doesn't forget her. Arya, so we shouldn't. I mean, we shouldn't anyway, but Arya doesn't. Arya uses her name. At Heron Hall, she's like, well, what's your name? She's like, Weasel, you know? And then later they're like, that, that's not your name. Uh, for a while she gets away with it, but Roose Bolton won't take, won't accept that. And he's like, Nam. Okay, Nam. There you go. There's your actual name, which, <laughs> which it isn't, but, you know. And, but it keeps Weasel's memory alive. It's, it's fitting that Arya in this position is also a ref, child refugee that's very similar to Weasel. And it en enhances her role as the embodiment of innocent people in war. And again, in A Feast for Crows, when Arya meets the waif, she thinks of Weasel again. So this character, Arya has not forgotten Weasel. Arya is probably going to think of Weasel again. I really doubt we ever see her again, but she's going to remain in Arya's mind. Uh, in a, in a, as a callback, maybe a little bit like how Tyrion thinks of Tysha. Now, Tysha's way, had a much bigger role in Tyrion's life, but it's a character that we'll probably never see again. Of course, we've never actually seen Tysha, but you get the point. Someone that keeps coming back, someone that in their memory they can't stop thinking about because of the impact, because of how sad it makes them, because of how impactful it was. Well, let's talk about Arya. Not lost to us, but certainly missing from the perspective of pretty much everyone, right? There's a couple people who know she's alive. You know, Hot Pie, <laughs> Gendry, a couple of the Brother Without Banners, Sandor, right? But even they don't know that she's still alive, right? They don't know, like, like, was with prior characters we've discussed just because they knew she was alive don't doesn't mean that they know she's still alive a lot could have happened and of course Arya can identify jane and jane can identify Arya, meaning not jane westerling <laughs> jane pool right jane pool jane of the missing nose who was forced to stand in for Arya uh, and marry uh ramsey so it's interesting too Arya. <laughs> Part of a missing, part of a recurring pattern for her. She's gone missing several times, right? She goes missing after the incident with Micah. Then she gets missing in the Red Keep when she gets lost chasing Balerion and ends up in the, you know, below the Red Keep in the tunnels and overhears Varys and Illyrio. And they're looking for her both those times. Like, where's Arya? Where'd she go? And, uh, you know, she's going to make some people disappear too. You know, she makes people go missing. She's already made Darien go missing, although the, the, Faceless men found out about that one. They may have even seen it. She also made Raph the Sweetling disappear in the Mercy chapter. They're probably going to know about that one too. <laughs> and her masters might have to, well, there's going to be a reckoning for her based on her, her creating more missing people. She's not supposed to have done that. That wasn't a thing that, that was an Arya thing to do. That was a revenge piece from Arya Stark, not something that, you know, no one would do. So, ah, yeah. That Arya herself is, uh, her return to the Seven Kingdom and how she becomes unmissing and who she becomes unmissing to is a lot to look forward to. But one of the conduits to that, one of the conduits to her return and one of the parts of her future is absolutely Nymeria. All the Starks are listed as missing in this episode, but Arya is the only one who's separated from her living wolf you know cr i wrote in the document cries in lady here because i had to put living wolf for that clarification there because as far as we know rick and still was shaggy brand's definitely was summer john's well ghost was not that far away you know ghost is at castle black when john, john may be stabbed. closer to ghost than he's ever been <laughs> that's true Inside second life. ghost <laughs> <laughs> good point <laughs> so the Riverlands has not forgotten about Nymeria, though. They may, they've, they've, they're more aware of Nymeria than they are of Arya, probably, because this wolf pack is just ruling the, the Riverlands, right? And it's in a manner that reminds me of her namesake, as in Nymeria of the Rhoynar. You got refugee wolves, you know, lost in a land that's not their own, right? And she's not from there. She's not from the Riverlands, right? She's from the north. And... Uh, you know, the Riverlands is kind of like where Nymeria the Roinar is from. They, they, that's the Riverlands of Essos. They, they're river people. The Roinar 
didn't expand beyond the river. They loved the river so much that they didn't really colonize elsewhere. So, yeah. A big question I have from Arya or for Arya about, about Nymeria is, will she lead the entire wolf pack? Because Nymeria leads the wolf pack, and if Arya can lead Nymeria, then that implies she will have like a wolf army. I don't know what she's going to do with that. Probably go north, but maybe not. Maybe it'll help free Jane Westerling and, and Edmure from this, this this group that's going to Casterly Rock from, from River Run that Jamie sent. Yeah, a lot of possibilities there. Arya was going to have quite a glow up from hiding beneath dungeons and following cats to peering through cats' eyes and leading perhaps an entire pack of wolves. If not that, definitely one enormous alpha wolf who every day grows more and more like her namesake. Maybe even more, maybe even more vicious. Yeah, Nymeria of the Runner wasn't vicious. She was just a good leader and had to make tough decisions. This, this wolfish being doesn't really have to make decisions. She just has to hunt and kill. And Well, I'm excited to see what the Chekhov's wolf is going to do. But definitely considered missing from Arya's perspective, even if she occasionally has dreams of her and, and probably knows she's in the Riverlands because that's where she let her go. That's where she drove her off, you know, back in book one. Sticking with the Starks, let's go to Sansa in the Vale. Elaine, we should call her, just like so many of the Starks. Not only are they missing, but they're under assumed names. That's really just for the Stark girls. Br Bran's still Bran. Rickon's still Rickon. Uh, but, you know, Sansa's Elaine. Arya's had, you know, countless names, right? And currently is no one, which is sort of a name, sort of not. Anyway, like Sansa, I mean, like Arya, we know where Sansa is, but she's concealed from almost everyone. There's definitely a few people that know where she is. But unlike Sansa, I'm sorry, I did it again. Unlike Arya, for the most part, no one suspects that she's dead. They sh suspect she ran off after the Purple Wedding. Well, she did run off. That's not a suspicion. That is what happened. Some people think she was a part of it. Some people think she helped poison Joffrey. Like, she's complicit. And that's why some people are looking for her. Some people think she has bat wings. Some people <laughs> think she has bat wings. I don't know. People think some crazy things. <laughs> You're right. People have some odd takes on Sansa. And we're not talking about theories about her <laughs> and by fans. We're talking about in-world. <laughs> that is an in-world... You know, it's like it's one of those tabloid style rumors that like most people wouldn't take seriously. But it, it, it it's still being said, <laughs> you know, like Rob Stark turning into a wolf. You know, it's like, yep, turning into a turning into a bat. So at least a few people have figured out who she is, though. And this is a good case of we don't need to discuss this one so much as just to point out where we've discussed it separately, which is in the Elaine T. Wow chapter episode where we discuss characters like Miranda Royce and the Mad Mouse who have probably figured out who she is. So she's not missing to them, but what will they do with this information, this limited information that only a few people have? And how will her reveal go? Like, Bran and reemerging from the North will be a big deal. Arya won't be as much of a political big deal, but the things she does after she comes back to Westeros will have a huge impact. And, you know, John, maybe we finding finding out about his death and maybe finding out about his heritage. That's a huge deal. Could have massive political implications. Rickon's reemergence could, you know, be a part of the claim to the North. Tyrion's reemergence will have a big impact on politics as well, which will probably be alongside Danny, which will have an enormous impact. So lots of these characters are going to have an enormous impact through their reappearance. Sansa will be one of them, revealing her true identity in front of the veil, whether on schedule or because someone else reveals it prematurely. Well, it's going to be big. And uh, she won't be missing anymore after that. <laughs> it will be that part of her story will have ended very suddenly and dramatically. And uh, we'll see what the reaction is going to be. But definitely, like her family, she's among the missing. Now, sticking in the veil, we got Nettles and Sheepstealer flying back far in time. As after Rhaenyra turns on her and Damon, of course, this is book version. It might go differently in the show. We might not even have a Nettles in the show. Uh, check out our episodes on House of the Dragon for theories about that. But anyway, sticking with the books, she flies off into the sunset, right? Like an actual literal flying off into the sunset. Actually, it's more like a, nope, not literal flying off into the sunset because 
She flew east. So she flew into the sunrise. <laughs> but whatever, close enough, close enough. Apparently made her home in the veil. The world of ice and fire revealed that there was a, maybe a strange fire witch that had a dragon. Who else could that be but Nettles? And this is apparently how the burned men clan became a thing. They would They would burn a piece of themselves to win her favor. And this tradition carried on because by now she's almost certainly dead. So she's not, in some sense, she's not missing because no one went looking for her that we know of in the story. But she's definitely missing from like, we want to know what happened to her and Sheep Stealer. Uh, maybe they just lived in peace the rest of their lives in the Vale in this remote location. But maybe not. Maybe there's more to it. Now, she doesn't die you know, during the war, which makes her special. One of the few dragon riders that survives it. Uh, but it's not clear that this is a happy ending. I mean, it's pretty sad, right? She doesn't have the connection to Damon, whatever it is. They don't get to live with that connection, whether it's a father-daughter relationship or as lovers. Either way, they don't get to have it. They don't get to experience this thing that they wanted. And they're betrayed by the side that they're fighting for, that they have honestly fought for. She wasn't going to change sides. So Rainier was just wrong. And she has to go live with clansmen, which, you know, maybe this is like a dances with wolves, dances with burned men thing where she was actually happy with it. But I wouldn't guess that. I don't think that living in exile was amazing. On the other hand, she might have could have gone somewhere else. I mean, she has her dragon. She could have flown off. If she didn't like it there, she had the means to go elsewhere. Maybe she couldn't imagine a place that would welcome her, though. Maybe like, where am I going to go live? Like, who's going to welcome me? I don't know. It, it doesn't. So I would lean towards this is not a good ending for her. Like, it was kind of sad. Anina agrees. This is not a this is far from a best case scenario. And she had to be isolated. And we've seen how being worshipped as a god isn't a good life. Like, Danny is lonely in that. And... Yeah, maybe she actually liked it, but nothing about what we learn about Nettles indicates that this would be a life she would enjoy. Then again, we don't know her very well. So this comes up in our Clans of the Veil vale episode, as well as, in, of course, in Dance of the Dragons, we cover Nettles as well. That's our series with Radio Westeros. I would love to know how long she lived. Uh, the burned men would know things about her. I kind of doubt that's a vector for us to hear about her, but it is possible. You know, they'd have like, I mean, if someone like Timmet, son of Timmet, would know the lore of their clan and, and there might be some information there. You know, you never know. Maybe uh, Tyrion's obsessed with dragons. The burned men will be associated with Tyrion, probably, if they're back in the story. And that's a path for that story to, to be told. But I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> but it's also really interesting, too, just the fact that she hid in the veil. She didn't leave the continent, you know. She didn't go beyond the wall. But other people, other people might, you know. Not on a dragon. You don't go beyond the wall on a dragon, apparently. But, yeah. Would love to know what happened to Nettles. Would love to know what happened to Sheep Stealer. Definitely consider her uh, belonging in this group. Now, uh, King's Landing. Several characters there. Tyrek Lannister. Nicknamed Wet Nurse because he was betrothed to a baby. This baby is also a lady, though. <laughs> it's Lady Ermasond Hayford, and it was a way for House Lannister to claim the Hayford lands. You know, Tyrek will have kids with Ermasond eventually, and their kids will be Lannisters because he's a boy. You know, they didn't do the keep her name. It wasn't a matrilineal marriage. Tyrek was one of Robert Squires alongside Lancel, so he was there when Robert was killed by the boar, and then we'll we're told it was Lancel who gave him the strong wine. Are we supposed to believe Tyrek was entirely ignorant of that? Well, maybe. He, it's possible. But he very likely observed or otherwise knew about it, was involved somehow. But he vanished during the riot in the Clash of Kings, the Bread Riot. Tyrion ordered a search for him. Then in A Storm of Swords, Tywin orders another search for him, insists on continuing it well after they have turned up nothing. Adam Marbrand is promoted to Lord Commander of the Gold Cloaks, continues the search for Tyrek, points out how Tywin is stubborn where his blood is concerned, and I mean to... Uh, Continue the search, basically the wording there. And there's some curious meta with Tyrek as well. Like back in the days when there was only the first two books, theories about Tyrek began to form. Like they were already pointing to Varus due to his absence from that procession, right? There's the, the they all go to see Marcella off and Varus isn't part of the group where you might expect him to be. 
And so there, that's the suspicion. It's like, well, Varus wasn't there. Maybe he kicks, kicked off the riot, snatched Tyrek, and has him in hiding somewhere. And this is basically what theories pop up in World two books later. In A Feast for Crows, all the fan theories are what Jamie basically has. He's like, Varus was probably involved. He may have started the riot. He wasn't there during it. You know, Ty- he may have taken Tyrek. Hmm. That's <laughs> all the theories that the fandom had about Tyrek are what Jamie has. So that was really neat and very meta. And it's potentially very valuable to Varys. Why would Varys want Tyrek? Well, it could doom Cersei's rule if she's outed for murdering Robber. Like, she, like, oh, we were also sad that Robert was killed, you know, and blah, blah, blah. But what if it comes out that she was part of it? That could be part of how. Varys helps his claimant get Cersei off the throne in order to install Aegon the sixth, who is who he's supporting. We're all very much looking forward to how Varys supports his claimant through subterfuge and whispers and intrigue, the type of which he's been holding back on because he's been, you know, playing it safe and playing both sides and making sure everyone gets a little bit of value from him so they all want to keep him alive. But now he's just full on my candidate. You know, and he's going to, the gloves are off where he can take people down and reveal all these secrets he's been hiding and whatever plans he's been pulling together for the past several decades, he's, it's ready, it's time to unleash those. So Tyrek, if Tyrek is somewhere in hiding under Varus's control, the winds of winter is when he might emerge, though he might now be, uh, you know, excess they they've already got their Lannister they've got Tyrion now do they also need Tyrek well they might because of what he knows because he's the witness to regicide and all these other things Tyrion is not a witness to Cersei planning to kill Jaime I mean (laughs) Robert (laughs) and uh, Lancel also knows however and Lancel might talk as well and you might need both of them talking you might need Lancel and Tyrek to verify the story because one witness might not be enough multiple people telling the same story you know, swearing on their sword or whatever. That, that that matters more than just one person doing it. Sticking with Cersei and her very uh, sh- sketchy leadership, her sh- you know slender hold on power, when things started to go bad for her, now she's recovered a bit, of course, but when it first started to go bad for her and the, the faith of the seven seized her, her young and inexperienced master of ship slash Lord Admiral, because, you know, she wanted those new titles in play, stole all her fancy new Dromans. She gave him command of them, and when she was captured, he just left, took all the ships and skedaddled. As we've said in a few places, uh, in a few prior episodes, he's most likely this new guy calling himself the Lord of the Waters, who is set up on the stepstone called Torturous Deep. There's a bunch of different stepstones. We don't have the names for all of them. Hey, you could call that missing. The names of some of the stepstones are missing. <laughs> but this one is called Torturous Deep. That's almost certainly Orane Waters. And his plot line will very possibly revolve around maybe stuff happening with Salador San also in the stepstones, but maybe even more likely to, to come up with, to connect to the Lysine ship that knows about Hardhome or Danny's ships coming through that will encounter him and maybe hook up with him or be an enemy. Who knows? There's a lot of... These 10 ships are very important uh, because they're very powerful. These are warships. And whoever gets them on their side will have a big edge because of that. It's a big boost to whoever will get them. And we have no idea whose side he'll take. But my guess is he'll do what a lot of ambitious people of power do is he'll hold back and wait to see who's winning, who's doing well, and then just show up one day and be like, yo, 10 warships, give me something, I'm on your side, you know? And he's a Valarian, he's a Valarian blood, so Danny might be predisposed to like him. He's good looking, which Danny, unfortunately, is a little bit susceptible to that. Not a lot. She's not, you know, like overwhelmed by, oh, this guy's good looking, I'm going to do everything. She's got a little of that. Not a lot of that. You see it with, with Dario. It worked on Cersei, or Cersei was like daydreaming about Orain and how he looked like Rhaegar. <laughs> so he's handsome, and that matters, I think, because of these these <laughs> the particular circumstances that are coming up here. But yeah, we'll see about him. Now, one who's not so handsome is Shaga. Uh, he falls in the general idea, like we kind of know where he is, but he's hidden. And but I mean by general ideas, he's in the Kingswood. 
He was sent there by Tyrion to give Stannis trouble, uh, give Stannis' army trouble before the Battle of the Blackwater. Battle of Blackwater is quite a while ago, y'all. As you know, end of Clash of Kings. We have not seen or heard of Shaga since, but we do know he's still there. And probably just sitting on the shelf. In terms of narrative, he's sitting on the shelf waiting for Tyrion to return to King's Land- uh, to either King's Landing or just to Westeros, at which point they will probably hook back up. They got along well. It, their c- conversations were amusing, too. Shag is funny, you know? Um... So I think we'll see him again. I think he'll hook up with Tyrion. And we also talk about him in the Clans of the Vale episode and uh, a little more, with a little more detail, a little more about what he might be doing in the meantime. But uh, yeah, he, he was worth a mention here for sure. Next up, Lara Rogara. Here's a one going into the past. He was mar- he, <laughs> She was married to Viserys, as in the Viserys who became Viserys II, the one who was handed the king for Aegon III and for... Aegon, who was the father of Aegon the Fourth, and was handed the king also for Baylor the Blessed. So this guy is the the Tywin parallel one, and Lara is part of the parallel because remember, for Tywin, Joanna dies young and it changes his personality. He becomes severe and kind of hardcore and all that, and all the love dies in his life. Similar here, Lara doesn't die, uh, but leaves him. She has kids with him and then leaves. She doesn't like Westeros. She never learns to speak common. Uh, She was a victim of a lot of prejudice and rumor mongering about her, kind of crazy rumors. Although given Lysine religion, we don't actually know. Maybe some of them are actually true, but it's a fairly safe assumption because she was known to be just incredibly beautiful that Viserys was into her. You know, you get this young teenager who's like married to the like one of the hottest women in the world with impeccable bloodlines and all this other stuff, rich family. Like he was probably very into her and, and given his reaction to her leaving too, kind of proves that, that he was turned sour by her, her, her departure. We cannot assume she was into him. Like he was a teenager, a young teenager, a boy, you know, where she's an, a woman forced to marry overseas to a language she doesn't speak. Uh, she may have just been waiting to leave all that time, but it's still tough. I mean, she had to leave her children, which doesn't necessarily kind of reflects poorly on her leaving your children. But on the other hand, like it was a bad life for her there. Maybe maybe her children, she wasn't probably allowed to raise them that much. They were kept separate from her a lot. Reminds me a bit of another character we're going to talk about here in a minute, but we do actually have a follow-up on her. And this was new to me as of this episode. I didn't know this, but according to Elio Garcia, there was a few notes that didn't make the world book. But one of them, uh, actually several notes that didn't make the world book. One of them is that Lara Regari returned to Lise in 139, which is later than we thought. I mean, she returned, uh, you know, and died six years later at only about 30 years old. So we don't know the circumstances of her death, but the, the Regari family had a huge collapse. And then a resurgence. And 139 is, I think, after the resurgence, not, you know, before, well after the collapse. So, or maybe it was the beginning of the collapse, beginning of the resurgence. Either way, 30 is pretty darn young to die so probably not good circumstances we can't assume it was murder but you know it's more likely when you're 30 to it's not that likely that she died of natural causes at such a young age but anyway we don't know more detail and if we do learn it it will probably be in uh, fire and blood 2 because fire and blood 2 picks up like right at that time Dorne is where we're going next, and yeah, a character with a lot of c- in common with Lara, a woman from Essos who had children with a Westerosi man, only to later return to their homeland. That's Melario of Norvos. Unlike Viserys and Lara, in this case, we're told there was a major mutual attraction confirmed, where I suspect that Lara wasn't all that into Viserys. But in the lo- long run, they just didn't have enough in common. That's what Doran basically says. It's like, yeah, we, we fell in love. George R. R. Martin says the same thing. Like, they, there was a lot of lust, a lot of mutual attraction. But oh, but when that wore off, maybe they didn't have as much in common. And she did not like being the, the, the married to the princess of Dorne or married to the prince of Dorne. She didn't like being the princess of Dorne. She didn't like that. She didn't like having her children used as alliances and sent away to be married. And she wanted to have her children around her. She wanted to, you know, be their mother and live with them. And this, this whole business of politics and these arrangements, she really didn't like it. I suppose she just didn't like Dorne that much either. Um, Ario Hota says it took a lot of getting used to, and maybe Milario never adjusted as much as he did. 
So with all her isolation, the the failed romance, pain of separation from her children and homesickness, she just left. And maybe we don't need to wonder about her fate. She's just in Norvos living her life. And maybe there's, you know, she's got some sadness, but maybe she's found love again. And, uh, you know, she wouldn't be having kids again. I don't think she's too old for that probably, but you know, maybe she's having a decent life in retirement and maybe there's a chance we'll, uh, we'll hear from her. I kind of doubt it. She's probably up up there among the characters we're least likely to hear from again, but never be too sure. Sticking in Dorne and sticking to the past, Tanzel Too Tall. Dunk certainly wants to know where she is, right? He certainly went looking for her and didn't find her. This one is interesting because it's entirely possible Dunk will meet her again. And hey, we had, uh, we wanted to know about that too, didn't we, Shea? Yes, I asked George this question directly at a convention years ago. I said, to quote, I just wanted to ask, I know you have quite a lot of Dunkin' Egg books planned. Are we ever going to see Tansel too tall again? Are we going to find out what happened to her? And then he had a big smile and he said, well, that would be telling, laughs. But I think there's a good chance, yes. And to be clear, I asked this question not because I expected to get a significant answer or anything like that. Sometimes I just like to ask a question to just be like, hey, George, we're, we, we like Tansel. We're thinking about her. She's on our radar. Like, I just like to kind of show him that we care about other things sometimes, I, I suppose. But I was very, ple- uh, very pleased that he... He gave kind of an affirmative. <laughs> and we'll also see Tanzel on the television because Duncan Egg is going to television. Uh, and there's no way TV audiences will tolerate no follow up. Yeah. They want Tanzel and Dunk. They're going to be give us that re meeting. They want people, t- TV audiences will clamor for a reunion, which apparently George has already planned to some degree. I don't know. I mean, think about it this way. Dunk's going to become famous. He's going to become Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, or at least at first, just a Kingsguard. He's going to be next to the king. Tanzel will know where he is. If she doesn't know, if he doesn't know where he she is, she will be able to find him, you know, uh, because he's going to be famous. So that might be how it happens is that she's the one who finds him. <laughs> He'll be easier to find. He's also easier to spot in a crowd, although she's tall. So, you know, she's not so hard to spot either. <laughs> to him, though, she's just the right height. Yeah. Willa. Ooh, boy, big missing person here. Part of the early mystery as to John's parentage is is Kat thinks Ashara Dane is John's mother. Ned himself says it's Willa to Robert when Robert's like, what was the name of your bastard's mother again? He says, Willa. Or in the show, he says, Wyla. I don't know. Whichever pronunciation doesn't matter. As we said earlier, Willa was Edric Dane's wet nurse as well. Edric says, I was Jon Snow's milk brother because Jon Snow is, mil- is, is Willa's mother. And uh, Ashara, Ashara, Arya is confused and insulted by that information because she's like, no way, my father never loved anyone but my mother. <laughs> this is, you know, a little girl's reaction to finding out that, no, actually, you, you, your parents can, can like other people. You know, it doesn't quite work that simply. You know, and you're, Ned knew people before Catelyn, too. This is before he barely even knew her, right? So, uh, it's pretty likely Will is alive, uh, because, you know, as a wet nurse less than a decade ago, that's not an old person's job, right? You can't, you know, you're not like a 60 year old wet nurse, right? That doesn't really work that way. So she's probably only in like her forties or something. She's probably not that old at all. Uh, maybe, maybe a little older than that, but she's definitely not at an age where you would expect she's has passed from, from natural causes. It's possible she's dead. Of course it's possible she's dead, but there's no reason to assume that. Unlike many of the other potential tower of joy witnesses, she's most likely there beforehand. In other words, she may have already been there when Lyanna was brought there too, or brought with Lyanna. Like she may have been summoned because Lyanna was pregnant. So when they moved into the Tower of Joy and decided to stay there for a while, like to f- facilitate the rest of her pregnancy, Willow was probably there that whole time. Most of what we see about the Tower of Joy is, you know, through Ned's perspective, maybe a little bit through some other places, but it's not generally through the perspective of people who were there before Ned, people who were there in that location before Ned and, and his party even knew where it was, before the Tower of Joy was even, you know, discovered by them or revealed to them. So she potentially knows a lot 
uh, maybe even some things that Benjen might know, as in things that they would discuss in private or that she would have overheard by being in the room when Leon and Rhaegar were talking about things. Like, she was probably there when Rhaegar was still there before he left to go back north and fight the war. Whereas, obviously, Ned and the others weren't didn't get to see that. She might have been witness to, you know, lots of conversations that between the Kingsguard and Rhaegar about a whole number of things about what he expected their duty to be and what they should do in case of this or that. So... Maybe the only person that knows or has access to this level of knowledge is maybe other <laughs> servants that were at in her, you know, in a similar role to her. But maybe not even that, because if Willa was specifically John's wet nurse, then I don't suppose John had multiple wet nurses. So really, she might have more information than just about anybody on the Tower of Joy. The only other person I think that might have more access is Bran by just looking into the past and seeing things that regular people can't see. So outside of magic, she knows the most, except maybe Benjen. But I think she's probably knows more than Benjen, and Benjen might not know anything. It's, we just guessed that Benjen might know some things or figured some things out. But really, I don't think I have a better candidate than Willa for knowledge about the Tower of Joy amongst the living. Right? Ned obviously knew some things, but he's dead, you know? And maybe Helen Reed. Like, Helen Reed, of course, is up there, too, because Helen Reed would know things that maybe Willa doesn't know, given Ned and his proximity to her and uh, to, to Liana, because Helen Reed knew Liana, too, and their connection also perhaps indicates some, some secrets that they pass between them. But as far as people who weren't Personally connected, as far as friendships with them, Willa is number one there. And uh, yeah, witness. That's a, a repeating trait for a lot of the missing characters we've discussed today. The reason they're missing narratively is because they know things that the story isn't ready to reveal. A lot of And it's not just like information they have. It's specifically that they were a witness to something. Old Town. Not too far from, from Dorne. Jockanagar. We don't have a lot to say about him, but he does kind of belong in this in this thing. He's he's been missing. We we're pretty sure he's at Old Town after a possible stop off at Pike. Of course, his description the description of the face he changes uh, into looks exactly like the alchemist that Pate sees. So that's why we think he's at Old Town. Uh, but of course, we're very curious what's going to happen next there, and if anybody else is going to go missing <laughs> because of him. And uh, what books might go missing when he leaves? So, yeah, Jack and Agar, and what 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 is going to happen next? Like, what happens when you know Euron shows up? Uh, is that going to mess with Jockin's ability to do things? Probably not. He's so skilled he could take the take on the face of an Ironborn, maybe, or <laughs> who knows, right? But it wouldn't do to have only one hidden character at the Citadel. We've got Sorella. Most of you listening have heard the. Alaris equals Sorella theory, which is arguably not even a theory, given how blatant it is. The name Sorella backwards is Alaris. I mean, you can't really get more blatant than that. Plus, the appearance matches the description of them. You know, they look the same. So at least she wants to get an education, and women aren't allowed at the Citadel. That might be all there is to it. She's in disguise as a boy so that she can have access to levels of education that aren't given to men. Might just be that. But it's not clear her family knows that. I mean, Doran Martell says... She's playing her own game. Uh, but, but that's such a vague thing. Like, what does that mean? Like, playing her own game in disguise, learning things at the Citadel? Is that what she means? Is that what he means by playing her own game? Maybe. But, but maybe there's a bigger purpose for this education. What is Sorella studying? Is it just she's following in her father's footsteps? Or maybe she has goals that involve learning specific things. She needs, she needs to be educated on certain subjects in order to facilitate these goals, whatever they are. I don't know. But just like Jock and Agar, maybe not just like Jock and Agar, she's in a location that's very uh, sketchy. It seems very safe, but it's not. It's, it's in great danger, the Citadel, Old Town in general, and that's going to matter. Whatever plot lines, whatever's in the future for her, whatever she's studying, whatever reasons it is, it could get very much interrupted. Uranus Interruptus could be happening here. One character who maybe got away uh, before any of this is Marwyn. Uh, Old Town is actually the one place we can be pretty sure he's not, even though it's the only place we've seen him, because he took ship and left. He took got on the cinnamon wind. Uh, at least that's what he said he was going to do. And he might just show up at Danny's court, and that'll solve that. Like, well, there he is, you know. But it's a little odd because he's not in the vision. 
the vision that that is told to Danny about or that she has of all the, you know, dark flame and, and Kraken and all these different people coming to her. Gray lips smiling sadly, all that business, right? He's not in this vision. So does that mean he's not going to show up? Does that mean something's going to happen on the way? Or does that mean maybe just <laughs> he just wasn't in the vision because there wasn't room for him? You know, there's so many people in that vision uh, didn't have room for him. But it's been a while, too. He left. I mean, he left at the end of the Feast for Crows. And, you know, Tyrion sailed all the way across the ocean in, in A Dance with Dragons, right? Some of that may have been, you know, concurrent. But still, Victorian sailed all the way across, too, right? Like, in, in that same time. So we've, we've had multiple characters sail all the way from Westeros to Slaver's Bay. <laughs> and it's not like Tyrion went straight there. He had all that time in Pentos and spent time elsewhere, you know, thrown overboard or, or rather his companions were thrown over or people he knew were thrown overboard, all this stuff. So yeah, what happened to Marwin? Is he missing? Is he going to turn up later? I mean, it'd be pretty weird if we never saw or heard from him again, but I definitely wonder what happened. Still sticking in old town. We have Leighton Hightower. We're told he hasn't come down in over 10 years. So he's not really missing because apparently he's been there, but, but it's weird that he's been up there for 10 years without any word. And... Yeah, so he's kind of like missing from the story in that, like, when's he going to take a, when's he going to do something? When's he going to have a role? You know, and what, what is that role going to be? And what are we waiting for? His name's been mentioned a few times, as well as that of his daughter, Mad Melora, who like, supposedly they're doing spells up there. And it's, it's kind of strange. The rumors are probably a little exaggerated, but the question remains, what are they doing? What's he doing up there? You know, what's he working on? And he has his other children doing things. One of them is Baylor Brightsmile, a.k.a. Baylor Breakwind. He is the heir to the high tower, And he's just working on the, the port, like working on, Gal uh, working on s adding defenses to the port of Old Town. But his younger brother, Humphrey Hightower, went to lease to hire cell sales. Now... I wonder about Humphrey because one of the reasons he's going there is to talk to Liness, who is uh, her, you know, her husband, a paramour. I forget what their actual title is. Uh, she has a lot of sway over him and he's rich. So maybe they can work something out there. And that could get interesting because there's another person over there. Edric Storm. Edric Storm is in lease. Arguably, he's not missing. He may be just one that y'all forgot about because we've known he's been in lease for a while. We've known that. But will he return to claim Storm's End? Or will he return to help fight the others? Because his father was a warrior. His, he, he, he takes after Robert a lot. And if the kingdom's under threat, what would a son of Robert do? He's like, I want to join the fight. You know? So mm, yeah, it's interesting to think, like, maybe he comes back with the High Towers. You know, uh, the High Towers declared for Renly. So it's not like they have some connection to Edric Storm. They're not like, they're not like Baratheon people, but... I mean, it's been a couple of years. Edric's probably gotten even bigger and he looks a lot like Robert. Uh, in fact, he looks even more like Renly. <laughs> so that's what, uh, remember, that's what Davos thinks when he sees him. He's like, oh my God, look at that. He looks so much like a Baratheon. So uh, Nina thinks that at the end of the series, Edric Storm will become a lord of Storm's End, not Gendry. So, you know, it's going to be one of the two, probably. I mean, it could be like Mia Stone or something else. There's other possibilities. But Mia Stone is, she's a veil person, you know. I don't, she seems less likely. But, you know, it's possible. Um, and it could be a king, not a lord. You know, it could be the first Baratheon king in, in a long time, depending on how the what happens with the Iron Throne. And, yeah, and uh, maybe Davos will be around because, you know, Davos and Edric had a good relationship. And Davos survives. That could be where he ends up in Edric's court uh, as an advisor. You know, that could be where he finishes things out. That'd be a good happy ending for, for Davos, probably. Sure, surely would for Edric, you know, if he's the <laughs> lord or king of, of the Stormlands at the end. That'd be good. Surviving all that business. Garmond Hightower and Reyna Targaryen's kids. This is Garmond himself. We're not w wondering about him and, and not so much about Reyna. Now, this is Reyna is in Bela's twin during the Dance of the Dragons. After the dance ends, she marries this Garmond Hightower, which is a sort of a peace thing, right? To heal the wounds of blacks versus greens. They have six children. Six. Decent chance we hear some of them in Fire and Blood too. But as of now, we don't know anything what happened to these, these high tower uh, Targaryen children. But it 
maybe helps explain why some of the high towers might look a little Targaryen, at least have the silver hair or that coloring hair. So that, that could help explain some of that. It's not a super long time ago, though not recent. We're talking 170 years in the past that those kids were born, roughly. So, eh, yeah, interesting. Sticking with Targaryens and dragons, we've already mentioned Nettles and Sheep Stealer, but there were three other dragons alive at the end of the dance besides Sheep Stealer. In addition to the lack of info on Reyna and her children there, we don't know what became of her dragon mourning, right? She had a dragon. She actually had a pink and black dragon that survived the dance. It was too small to really be used in war. And so alongside her missing children, we don't know what happened to her dragon, you know, but it definitely died before 153 because 153 is when the last dragon died. <laughs> Of course, we also don't know the name of that last dragon, so it's a na missing name. <laughs> My headcanon is that Morning was the second last dragon to die. But we don't know why. It could be because magic was waning and, you know, a lot of these dragons were less healthy. It could be the Maester Conspiracy. They were poisoned, something like that. But the problem with the Maester Conspiracy killing off some of the dragons, like it, it could work for Morning and, and the last dragon because they were small and the Maesters had access to them. It doesn't really work as a solution for what why the cannibal and silver wing vanished cannibal no idea when cannibal passed but also prior to 153 because of you know well he wasn't the last dragon maybe also cannibal died to magical waning or maybe cannibal was actually as old as some of the wilder rumors suggest and he just died of old age open mystery for sure silver wing uh, shay is pulling up the map here and this map has a special location or special uh, familiarity for us red lake why is a uh, what is it about Ro red lake that uh, that has such a connection to you ashea oh well on michael clarfeld's uh reach map specifically i am rose of red lake uh one of garth greenhand's children one of his many children uh, along with other people in the fandom <laughs> but right. uh, yeah i'm rose of red lake so he was like can you pull up a map shot of red lake and i was like actually yes <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. If you weren't Rose of Red Lake, it wouldn't have been possible. <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect match, Rose of Red Lake. I mean, Shay has red hair, and yeah, it's a great great fit for that. Turn into a bird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Rose of Red Lake was supposedly able to turn into a bird, which usually that rumor is means they were a skin changer, right? Uh, having control over an animal is often kind of how that is expressed. So Silverwing chose a great location around some skin changer houses, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Red Lake is maybe like a microcosm of the God's Eye because there was a lot of stories about magic of the old gods and, and skin changing that are associated with Red Lake. And there's an island in the center of it, which is where Silverwing made her home and apparently passed over, you know, eventually just ate fish and animals and just got left alone and eventually died but apparently before 153 which yeah don't know why she died that wouldn't have been a super long lifespan Silverwing was born uh you know in the what in the 20s or 30s i forget so maybe a 130 year lifespan or something like that next up we have ray and daella or sorry daya daya as we say, according, thanks to the pronunciation guide provided to us by Chloe of Girls Gone Canon. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Daea like paella. That's right. A delicious Targaryen. That's right. <laughs> so, of course, these are the also the sisters of Aemon, Maester Aemon and Daron, the drunkard and Arian Brightflame. Because, of course, those that's Egg, those are Egg's brothers. So there were there were six siblings there. Daea was the fourth. <laughs> Ray was the sixth. So you get three boys, then Daella, and then and then uh then Egg, then Ray. So they both married and had uh no children or had children plural. So we both Daella and Ray had children plural, but we have no idea who they married or how many children they had or what became of those children. So it's kind of a missing piece of the Targaryen family tree. None of them would have been named Targaryen, so that's why maybe you it's not it wouldn't necessarily be they're not Targaryens, but they have Targaryen bloodlines that went out there somewhere and not that long ago, right? Aemon, when he's dying, thinks of he wishes he could see Rey and Daella with their children, right? That's what he's just thinking of what he'll see. So they, they have clearly passed by then too, but he's expecting to maybe see them in the afterlife or something like that. Um, so 
open question what happened to them. And there's also, when we do hear the stories, like filling some of these the stories of these characters out a bit, there's got to be a reason why Egg married Bessa instead of Daea, because that's what was expected. Ray specifically gave a love potion to Egg so that she'd marry her instead of Dale. So that was clearly the expectation for a while there. But that, you know, instead Black Betha happened, probably because they fell in love and they accepted that marriage and their love because Egg was so far down the line of succession at the time. Now, obviously that changed, but that's why he's called Egg on the Unlikely. Magor and Daenora Targaryen, not Magor the Cruel. We know exactly what happened to him, although we don't know who killed him or why he died. We know where it happened. <laughs> this is the child of Arian, Bright Flame, who was, who was passed over at the Great Council. Not Arian passed over, but Magor, baby Magor. Uh, it was passed over in part because he was a baby, but also because of who his father was. They're like, well, if he was an adult and he had shown he wasn't insane like his father, maybe. But uh, the coin flip hasn't happened yet. The Targaryen coin flip hasn't happened when you're only a baby. Because, well, maybe it has happened. It just hasn't manifested yet. So, you know, that's a, that's a thing. And his mother, Daenora, who was the third child of a third child, was the one married to Arian. And she disappears after Arian's death. We don't know what happened to her. She doesn't apparently remarry. And we didn't exactly know much about her before that. So, yeah, another historical female character that kind of vanishes. And uh, that's another missing character. This is a, this is right along with Ray and Daella. These are same timeline, basically. So when these stories get filled out, I guess the plan would be during Duncan Egg. This is apparently when we, would, we could expect to get answers if these stories are ever written. But that is where they would fall. There's also Vaella, who was born before these characters, but only 10 or 11 years before uh, Magor. So this would have been another young Targaryen. Now, she was the daughter of Kiera of Tyrosh and Daron the Drunkard. Remember, this is Kiera's second Targaryen marriage. She was first married to Valar and then... When Valar died in the Great Spring Sickness, uh, she remarried to Daron. But Kira, but uh, Vaela Targaryen, this child of, of Kira and Daron, was considered sweet and simple-minded. So she was alive at the time of the Great Council, but she was passed over. She was only, you know, like I said, 10 or 11 years old. So she wasn't very old, but also not seemingly not. It wasn't because she was a, a girl, although that didn't help. She was, like I said, simple-minded, but also too young. So, yeah. Now... Sadly, Vaela, Magor, Denora, there's a pretty straightforward potential fate for them. And some of these others, like Ray, Daella, some of their children, Summerhall might have done for all of them. Probably not all, but maybe quite a few of them. Because a lot of the Targaryen family was apparently present for that. It was super tragic. And, well... Some of them had to have been there, right? So probably the fates of some of these characters is is Summerhall. But it's also kind of unlikely that all of them died there. So there's got maybe a few dangling threads here and there, some other Targaryens that might have been around. Shiera Seastar, another example of a character we don't want to spend much time on because she got her own episode, so check out the Shiera Seastar episode. But we just don't know what happened to her. Blood Raven went missing in world and then forgotten about because so much time passed. We don't know if people looked for her or whether she just vanished or whether she died and they just said, okay, she's dead. So have a funeral, but she might've also been a summer hall. That's a slight possibility. You know, she wouldn't have been, she would have been kind of old, but not super old. She would have been in like her seventies, but we just have no idea what happened to her. Similarly, we have no idea what happened to quite a few different black fires. There's big gaps in the family tree. We don't even know how many Blackfires were missing, but there's some that for sure are missing, so let's focus on those. Damon Blackfire's first five sons are known. They have names and all that, but we don't even have the names of the sixth and seventh sons of Damon. And there's at least one accounted for daughter as well, because he had daughters. We know of Calla Blackfire, who married Bittersteel. So there's at least one more daughter, maybe just one, but maybe multiples. George did say Calla Blackfire and Bittersteel didn't have children. I personally asked him that question, so I'm pretty sure about that. Although George did say, I don't think so. So he kind of left the door open to change his mind. But that's probably a dead end. 
So it's possible that these other sons had more children, the ones of Damon's first five sons, but not the first five. Uh, the only of the first five who had sons was Hagon. So Amon and Aegon, the twin sons, were died on the red grass field, way too young to have had kids. Damon, the second we see him in the mystery night, he didn't have kids. And then the fifth one was Aenys, the one that was invited to make his case for the great council. Then Bloodraven seized him and executed him. There's no indication he was married either. Hagon, who was the claimant for the third Blackfire Rebellion and who was the fourth son of Damon, definitely had children. Uh, and one of them was named Damon. <laughs> and that kid was the fourth Blackfire claimant, that Damon who was killed by Dunk. So uh, there may have, like I said, that Damon may have also had kids, but Hagon definitely had at least one more son. So again, there's the sixth and seventh sons of Damon Blackfire, and then maybe more from Hagon. Those children somehow had more kids and this led to Maelys the Monstrous eventually and Maelys killed his cousin, another daemon, for control of the Golden Company. So that daemon was a descendant of these people as well. And one of the Blackfires had filed teeth. That was one of the... Because <laughs> so, of the, the skull we see as part of their, uh, you know, next to Bittersteel and these other skulls, so... Uh, that's an interesting character. We, I'd like to learn more about him and why he filed his teeth. And I guess he used them as a weapon or just to intimidate people. But goodness, that's scary. The mother of all Blackfires is kind of missing too. This is Dane of the Defiant. We don't know much about her at all. I really hope George fleshes this out. She might have been anything from the primary driver of her son's ambitions to dead before the Blackfire Rebellion ever began. That's how little we know about her, that these are both possibilities. And those are pretty distinct differences, right? Those are, those are, that's a wide range of options there. Nina guesses that Dana died relatively early. Uh, Elena, her sister, was described as living, quote, much longer than her sisters. But Elena lived into her 70s, so there's still a lot of room for, like, Dana to have lived into her 40s even 50s, that's 20 years, 30 years longer than than Dana. So Dana is one of the bigger characters we have here that could have a big impact on what we know about the Blackfire Rebellions if more gets revealed. And if Blackfire Rebellions ever hits TV, which it's not a slender hope, it's a very decent chance we get that. Ryan Condal's a huge fan of it. House of the Dragon might go there one day, you know, because it's an anthology style show. They will have to flesh out Dame the Defiant. They might decide just to have her die early, but it's a really good chance to have a strong female character at court that a lot of people, I think a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of potential for people to like her a lot. She's like a character that has a lot of potential, I think, for being popular, you know, which that's going to be something HBO and Ryan Condal or whoever works on the show is going to be like, yeah, we want to, this is a good character. Let's make use of her. So I've got a lot of hope that we will see her. And it's an interesting hope because it's, le you know, George maybe doesn't have time to flesh all this out. So we might be more likely to see her on TV than we are to get the fleshed out book version of her. But hopefully we get both. We briefly transition to the Iron Islands because we don't have a lot of missing characters here to talk about. In fact, we only have one uh, at the moment and then some follow up later. And that's Aaron. He's not actually missing from our perspective. We know he's strapped to the the prow of the silence or silence it's not the silence it's just silence and probably gonna die there right like it doesn't seem like he's gonna get out of that predicament um but he's missing by the perspective of the iron islands like no one on the iron islands knew where he went he was kidnapped so this is a good example of someone taken by force in secret and they're all like oh he's doing his thing we don't know he's he's gonna reemerge one day and Etc. But no, he's not going to reemerge one day. <laughs> Only Christopher Botley, of all people, has guessed correctly of what happened to him. He guesses that Aaron is dead already, which, yeah, he's not too far off on that because he probably is about to be. And that's probably coming very soon because, yeah, uh, the next time we see Aaron will probably be his last chapter. It seems unlikely that he'll have another one. And he might not even have another one, but I do think we'll have one more. Exactly one more. <laughs> Uh, Slaver's Bay. Daenerys. She's missing. We know where she is, kinda. She's on her version of Dragonstone in the middle of the Dothraki Sea, which is enormous, an enormous place. But 
more importantly, within the narrative, she's missing to the Miranese and the Yunkish and the Astapori. And her absence and fears of her death are causing a lot of chaos. Barristan is acting as if she's alive. Good for him. He's holding on to hope. He's being loyal, doing what a good knight should do. Meanwhile, other people all throughout these cities are acting as if she's dead, gambling that she's dead, or holding out hope. And it's just a big variety. And it's just causing a lot of anxiety within the city. Some people are like, when is she going to come back? We need her to return. Where's our mother? Some people are like, kind of, what would seem realistic is that she's not. They're like, yeah, I mean, she flew away. Like, that didn't look good. Like, are we are we going to ever see her again? It's been so long. With each passing day, it gets less likely that she's going to return. So her being missing is causing a lot of problems. Just her, her lack of presence is driving a lot of the story from the POVs we see through Barristan. And basically, we're starting to see POVs outside of Marine in the bay and you know as the battle is raging with Tyrion and uh maybe Victarion as well as just now shit well he has just showed up but it remains to be seen what his POVs will reveal as far as Daenerys and and that plot line but he's there his his chapters could involve this or reveal some of this but the biggest name who's in that area like I said is Tyrion the major POV character he's missing too <laughs> right we again know where he is he's right in that tent <laughs> with the second sons but everyone in Westeros thinks he's missing. He escaped from prison and a lot of people want him found. Many of those simply because there's a reward. They want to collect that reward. But if Cersei loses power, that reward offer becomes worthless. Like she can't reward, give a lordship to someone when she's no longer on the throne. So She's used his absence as a boogeyman, though. Kind of like how Danny's absence is driving a lot of story. Cersei's capitalizing on it by blaming him for things. She's like, she plans on mur having Tristane killed and blaming it on Tyrion, right? Uh, but not just is she... Part of the reason she's doing this is because she sees him as a boogeyman and believes other people will too. She's legitimately scared of what he's going to do. And she's probably right to be scared because he does want revenge. And he said some nasty things about his intent towards her when he gets a chance. He's a, he's an exile. He's the monster they made him into. And he's got powerful and dangerous allies. Yeah, she should be worried about what he's going to do in general and to her. So in order to make him into more of a monster to make him into somebody that no one will follow. She's demonizing him further by saying, look, he's killing the heir to Dorne. Look at these things or the secondary heir to Dorne and all these other things. So blah, blah, blah. I guess tertiary heir. Really? He's the third, <laughs> third in, in line, but still that's a Prince of Dorne. It's a big deal. You know, she's trying to keep Dorne as an ally while not being as close of an ally. And you, by blaming it on someone who's not there. They're not going to, it's not going to work, I don't think. I don't even think Tristane will die because, of course, Doran knows about the plan. He's the one that tells us about it. So, yeah, he, Tristane will be fine, at least as far as that plot goes. He might be in danger like five minutes later. But, yeah, so you see, it isn't just the Starks. It's a huge chunk of the major characters, POV or not. Some that aren't missing were missing at one point, like, where did Stannis go? He disappeared from even dragons. Oh, there he is. He's at the wall. Theon went missing for several books. Yeah, he's in the Dreadfort dungeons, but no one, like almost no one in the world knew that. Only like, like Ramsay or Roos told Catelyn and she maybe told a few people, but she was told at the Red Wedding. When did she, when, what time was there for her to spread that information? You know, right before that, right? So it wasn't really publicized very much. Major non-POV characters, uh, an example of, is Varus. Varus went missing after Tyrion's dis disappearance because he helped Tyrion disappear and he knew he would be incrim uh, incriminated in that. He's pretty much still missing, even though we finally see where he appeared out of the, the passages to pop up in the Tower of the Hand to shoot Kevin and then presumably go back into the shadows where he's continuing to operate. But he was missing for several books there. We didn't see him at all. Uh, well, a book and a half. Basically all of A Dance until the last chapter and all of A Feast for Crows. Euron was missing for a long time. Like, it's a big part of his story is that he was exiled and then returned at a very opportune time that he probably planned. 
which involved the murder of his brother. So uh, to be fair, in a world, in a low tech world like this, a giant world with humongous world building and as well as just the size of the continents, it's not that hard to go missing. If you have, it only takes modest means to go into hiding. Although it is harder when people are looking for you, powerful people are looking for you. Related to Tyrion is Makoro. I don't mean they're related like their family, <laughs> like Makoro is some long lost Lannister. He's on Victorian ship. We know exactly where he is. But I included him here because he went overboard while with Tyrion and Jorah and Penny, and it's gonna blow Tyrion's mind when he sees him again. He's like, holy crap, how are you alive? You went missing in the middle of the ocean. It's not something where you can just like explain it away. Like, oh, he probably, wait, no, how? How is this possible? <laughs> how did he live? It's gonna change Tyrion's mind on some things. I think Tyrion, among all the characters, is one of the most skeptical about magic. He's one of the most disbelief. He, he calls them snarks and grumpkins. You know, he doesn't really believe a lot of these. And that's interesting because he has this fascination with dragons and all that. So he's, he's, he's open to the supernatural when, it, when they're in that form. But in terms of like ghosts and, and demons and the others and things like that, he, he, he kind of laughs at it, which of course he's wrong to do that, which is ironic because he's one of the more intelligent and more educated characters. But this alone has the chance to move the needle for him. Just seeing Makoro alive, like that has to be supernatural. He's not going to have an ordinary mundane explanation for that. And of course, Makoro would say the same. He's like, yeah, the Lord of Light protected me and then blah, blah, blah. And he's like, if the circumstances were different, Tyrion would be like, yeah, yeah, sure. The Lord of Light protected you, blah, blah, blah. But this one, he's like, no, uh, really seems like how did you not die of thirst and exposure? Like he was out there for 10 days. Like, yeah, that's not normal. That's not natural. Melisandre could have survived that too, given what we know about her, but that's clearly supernatural. So this is maybe more like Stannis seeing Davos again. Like, oh my God, I thought you were dead, except it won't be, it won't be pleasant. It won't be as like, it won't be like, oh my God, my best friend's alive. You know, Davos is, and Stannis are like besties, but for Tyrion, Tyrion's not Makoro's bestie. He'll be like freaked out rather than happy, you know? So, uh, and Stannis already has a red priest who dis who disabused him of, of disbelief in magic. Stannis also was like, I didn't really believe in the gods. He was like, Ash, these are just things people say, you know? But Stannis has seen shadow babies and seen things in the flames and all these other things. So his disbelief is, is, is long gone. And I think Tyrion is on that same path of a disbeliever who's going to believe. Uh, speaking of Makoro, the place he is is Victorian's fleet, who have some missing of their own, don't they? What happened to all of those ships? A lot of vanished ships. So many that we are a little suspicious. Now, if 10, 20, even 30 ships were missing, it's a dangerous journey. They went through Sothorius. They went to some really difficult places. So yeah, some ships missing makes sense. But it's like 50 or 40 something ships. It's so many that you gotta wonder, like maybe some of them just didn't want to go. They just took, they just said, screw it, I'm not going. But it's suspicious. And a large percentage of the missing ones went missing down in Sothorio. So that could be an uh, indication of something that happened down there. Anyway, I wanted to include them. No names in this. We, we have ship names maybe, but we don't have people names. So let's just acknowledge that Victorian's fleet, the Iron Fleet, uh, is, might be some extra ships out there somewhere. I don't really believe in the Euron theory that Euron, they were going back to go to Euron. But it's a, it's a legitimate place for them to go if they get lost and they're like, we got to go back. They would go back home and thus be under Euron's command again. But I don't suppose that's a large number of them. Speaking of sailing, speaking of places that Tyrion and Makoro went, they passed by Valyria, right? They, they went near it. And... Uh, Quite a few people have claimed to go to Valyria or, or actually have gone, maybe. <laughs> but we yeah, but we actually see it in the distance in that Tyrion chapter. And Tyrion's uncle, Jerrion Lannister, sailed to Valyria to search for Bright Roar after their ancestor, King Tommen, sailed there with Bright Roar and never returned. So he was a missing person who became a missing person. This is Benjen ish, where one person goes missing. Missing? One person goes missing. Another person goes to search after them and also goes missing. Uh, so that is basically the story of Jerrion and Tommen Lannister before him. 
Uh, I don't think we'll ever hear what happened to them. There's a lot of theories about Jerrion being like the shrouded lord or some other things like that. I don't know. I kind of doubt it. I think he's gone. I think he's dead. But I would like to know the circumstances of it. I would like to know, you know, I would like follow up regardless and to hear maybe the, 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 the volunteers mess with him. We talk about that in the Lost Valyrian Steel episode. Like maybe they were welcoming to his endeavor only t- because they saw it as an opportunity to uh, rip him off. Rohan Weber. That's right. Pretty big missing person from the Duncan Egg era. After marrying Eustace Weber at the end of the Sworn Sword, she later remarries to Gerald the Golden Lannister. Now, Gerald the Golden, that's uh, that's Tywin's grandfather. And uh, they have kids together. Then one day, less than a year after her fourth child with Gerald, she had more than four children, but four with Gerald, she up and disappears under mysterious, quote, under mysterious circumstances in the year 230. So 230, that's three years before the Great Council. Still during the reign of Makar, right? So unless she was murdered or something, it's clear that this is a, a big old fat gardener seed planted by George to tackle during the Duncan Egg era, I suppose. But it says disappears under mysterious circumstances. So I don't, doesn't sound like a murder. It sounds like, but it might be, you know, uh, it's an interesting time for them, right? So three years before he becomes king. So there's a little, it might be the last... Duncan Egg tail before Egg is a king. And that obviously would change the, the direction of the Duncan Egg novels, but they, they could, you know, they'd still be cool. They'd still have lots of things they could do, but it would be Egg as king and they wouldn't be wandering around anymore. So that's a different, like a different vibe there. And yeah, so. It would be Dunk King Egg. Dunk King Egg. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now, speaking of Lannisters, Tysha, big name. Tyrion met her when he was 13 and she was 14, so she would be about 28 or so now. Tyrion constantly thinks of her, but I don't think we'll ever see her. I don't think we're meant to. I don't think there's a narrative purpose to her appearing. I do say that with the the caveat that I'm not a writer. I'm uh, narrative purposes. That's the province of writers of someone George you know but still you know as a reader you can kind of get a sense of what would make sense and what wouldn't and uh, yeah I don't think so his father's cruelty to the entire family is part of the story here like how Tywin made Jamie complicit in it he forced him to be part of this awful thing and Tyrion he forced Tyrion into it but it was Tyrion still participated. You know, it was, it's part of Tyrion's own darkness by being brought into it. Part of it was choice. Part of it was compulsion. And it's the focal point of Tywin's death scene. When Tywin is shot by Tyrion, it's, it comes down to this insistence on referring to her as a whore, which she definitely wasn't. Like, this is, that was the lie that Tywin forced Tyrion to believe, that tricked Tyrion to believe. And it's the reveal of this lie that has Tyrion so mad yet Tywin just to his face insists on maintaining that lie even though the lie has been completely outed like he's like I know the truth you paid for this you arranged for this you know you, or that that story about you paying for it was made up post facto to because you in your paranoid you know view of the lowborn assume that no it must have been because she was after Lannister gold it couldn't have been because she was into you like, wait, thanks for the vote of confidence, dad. You know, uh, it's brutal all around. His attitude towards it, his handling of it, and the impact it has on, yes, Jamie and Tyrion, but on Tysha, the one who is the hidden character, the one who we don't see the impact on her, right? We don't know what happened. We don't know if she's even still alive. I mean, people think she's the Titan's daughter. I don't think she's the Titan's daughter. That seems so random to me, you know? She did have the money. She did get paid, it was sufficient money to leave Westeros, which you might see why she would want to go somewhere else and never be there again. I hope she went somewhere nice, like the Arbor, and not in the areas that Euron's men have raided. Obviously, I don't want her to be there. Somewhere nice, you know, maybe she could have a retirement and peace. I don't know. It's so hard to predict. It's just headcanon that I hope something nice happened to her. But if she does reappear, if I'm wrong, and she does reappear, my best guess is that it's the same thing as Dunk in that Dunk doesn't find Tanzel. 
And of course, Duncan Tanzel's relationship is nothing like Tyrion and Tysha's. But the, 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 the difficulty of them finding each other is somewhat similar. And of course, Tysha may not want to find Tyrion. And in fact, I doubt that she does. But if she does, it would be because Tyrion is now Lord of Castle Rock. He's returned from exile. He becomes Lord of Castle Rock. Then it's easy to find him. She knows where he is. If she wants to go say hey, she wants to go yell at him, she wants to poison his wine, she'll know where he is. You know, uh, but this seems like a thing that would happen beyond A Song of Ice and Fire, like afterwards, like in the aftermath that we wouldn't necessarily have time for. It's a dream of spring and beyond thing, if that. Maybe, maybe it's a thing that we leave Tyrion with, that he thinks about trying to find her. He's like, hey, now I'm Lord of Casterly Rock. The war's over. Maybe I could track down Tysha and, you know, apologize or something. I don't know what he would want to do, but an apology would certainly be part of it. But it's not something that could be like how we leave him. You know, we it stays. She stays a missing person even at the end of the story, although the, the door is open for maybe him finding her. It's possible. I don't know. Taisha is a big one, though. Taisha is one of the biggest missing characters, even though we don't expect to see her. But because of such a she has such a huge impact on not just Tyrion, but all the Lannisters, less so Cersei, but. But even her, like it comes up because Cersei like throws it in Tyrion's face. Like, oh, you shamed us all with that marriage, blah, blah, blah. So in the Stormlands, not a lot of Stormlands characters that are explicitly tied to the Stormlands. We've got one here that I want to mention. That's Rhaegar's second squire, Richard Lonmouth. Now, Rhaegar's first squire was Miles Mooton. Miles Mooton was killed during the rebellion, so there's, he's not missing. But Richard Lonmouth, there's no fate recorded for him. At, and he's an interesting one because at the tourney of Harrenhal... He was seen drinking and playing playing a drinking game with Robert Baratheon. And both of them, Robert and Ares, were among those who promised to... Uh, Robert and Ares, sorry. Robert and Richard promised to unmask the Knight of the Laughing Tree. When he put out his call, he's like, unmask the Knight of the Laughing Tree. This is no friend of mine. Yeah, Richard Lonmouth was one of the people who said, I'll do it. Of course, he didn't. It was Rhaegar, <laughs> apparently. But Mira refers to Richard Lonmouth as the Knight of Skulls and Kisses due to his sigil. And the twist is, who did he fight for in the rebellion? This is a Stormlands guy. You'd think he would fight for Robert, but he was Rhaegar's squire. And he was still Rhaegar's squire. He was, it wasn't like after being Rhaegar's squire. It was still like in progress. So that's a tough choice. That's like, who do you fight for? Like, this is a good example of someone that had a really, really tough decision to make. Like Stannis, like uh, a few others, like the the... Well, like a few others, lots of examples of people who had a tough choice there. I just can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, and there's a popular theory uh, propo uh, proposed by Lady Gwyn that Richard Lonmouth is none other than Lem Lemoncloak. You can, I, I highly suggest you read it. Just Google Lem Lemoncloak Richard Lonmouth and you'll find it. And Lady Gwyn goes into a lot of the details to show why they have things in common, physical characteristics, things like that. And... The important part, the narrative purpose. Why would he be alive? Well, because Richard Lonmouth would have been there for Lyanna's abduction, for a lot of things that happened between Rhaegar and Lyanna. So he's another character that whose importance to the narrative is very much wrapped in being a witness to Rhaegar Lyanna stuff. He might have even gone with Rhaegar to the Tower of Joy. He's a squire. Right? Uh, yeah, it's entirely possible. So this guy could know a lot. And if he is Lem Lemon Cloak, well, then there you go. And if he's not Lem Lemon Cloak, he might be alive and out there somewhere. So, well, yeah, it's a big one. That's one of the more obscure ones, but he has information that might be on the level of, um, nearly on the level of a Willa or, um, or a Benjamin. A couple other last random ones we have here. And then some comments from y'all, because that's a good one. Uh, because, or rather, because you all have some good suggestions, I'm assuming. I haven't had a chance to look through them yet since they're, they were added to the document during this episode, but <laughs> I assume so. The Sorcerer Who Cut Varys. Good example. One that we probably won't see. Almost certainly you aren't going to see or hear about or anything like that. He may not even exist, as we talked about in our Varys education episode he might be entirely made up <laughs> and he was already a man grown probably older when Varys was young so very good chance this person's dead even if old age or, or what have you but i thought he was worth a mention he's he was on our mind because the Varys episode was recent and you know he's somebody 
that we don't have a fate for. Quaith. The bigger question about Quaith is who she is or what her deal is. Uh, she may not be someone else, even though she's masked and we're curious. And her location is probably just somewhere in Karth. But her interest in Danny and the fact that she appears in at least one dream is like, well, where where is she doing this from? If she's got like a glass candle that's enabling her to appear in dreams, well, where is it? Where is this glass candle room? What does it look like? Like, is this like a sorceress, you know, chamber? Like, yeah, I'm curious about that. Or is she following Danny? Like, is she actually trying to be in her proximity for later deeds? Is she trying to like show up and give her advice, you know? Because uh, she's trying to guide her through dreams. Why not in person, you know? Hmm. Quaith is a uh, one of the more mysterious characters there is. And right now we don't know exactly where she is. So I thought she was worth a mention here, even if the bigger part of her role is is better discussed elsewhere. There are always more characters one could consider missing, given it can be a matter of perspective. Again, I, I used a very wide open definition of missing here, and you could certainly have taken it a little wider or picked on some that I didn't think of. The unnamed Princess of Dorn. What's her deal? We haven't even, we don't even know her name. Like, that's Elia and Oberyn and uh, Dorn's mother, and she was the la ruling lady of Dorn. Brandon Led and Brandon Led. Brandon, Ned, Liana, Benjen's mother. That's Rickard's wife. Liara. We know she's dead, but what happened to her? We, we They don't think about her, you know? Not that Ned thinks about much of his family. Ned doesn't think about his, his own father either, so it's not like... <laughs> he just doesn't think about a lot of his past. Ned just... Yeah, his past is painful. He just stays out of there. Uh, there's telling examples like, why is the Iron Bank never mentioned in Arya's chapters? That's more of like a missing thing that's meant to keep build the mystery, I think, you know? Why is Daenerys never mentioned in Davos and Melisandre's chapters? Probably for similar reason. It's something the lines of, it's not time yet for that. They haven't learned about it yet. And George hasn't decided that it's time for them to learn about it yet. And it's, it's not like this doesn't make sense. Stannis and Melisandre are so far away out of, out of where you would be getting news about the rest of the world right now, you know? There's children of like Bela and Oakenfist. We'll wonder about them. But that'll also probably get covered in Fire and Blood too. We could get really obscure, really ultra obscure. Like, we joke about bears and Mormont women, but hey, where's the male direwolf that fathered all those Stark wolves, right? <laughs> where's the dad? Where's Papa Direwolf at? He's probably still out there, right? <laughs> it wasn't an immaculate conception of a, of a lady direwolf, was it? I mean, maybe it was. That would make it even more, you know... Um, Mystery and supernatural element in the series. Like, the gods really are playing a role here. They're immaculately concepting a, a direwolf here to give these to the kids. Yeah. And so one of the one of the tricks with this episode was it's sometimes it's easy. Like, it's some of these mysteries are prominent. But it's not always easy to tell what's not there. Like, when something's missing, you don't always notice it's missing, you know? So I'm, again, this is my caveat for I'm quite sure we missed some. Please let us know who we missed. Let's start here with uh, some of these examples sent in during the episode here we've got cannibal the dragon says did you guys talk about alice rivers and her unnamed baby and the dragon she may have no see good example that's a big one that i didn't mention and you're in a house strong shirt i'm even wearing a house strong shirt dang it so yeah what happened to her like fire and blood 2 is that should cover that but it's like that narrative is kind of dropped near the end of the book like alice rivers was like defeated the challenge to her holding heron hall and there's no follow-up on it and she said she had a baby with aemon that might just be a lie but what about the dragon maybe that was an illusion but geez yeah there's a lot of mysteries there and part of them are just as where is alice rivers what happened to her so yeah good call good proof of of the of the my point that there's just too many of these to keep track of them all Igrit Werewood says, did Maester Wallace get a mention? That's Winterfell's Maester before Lewin. I don't consider him missing. I did dig into this. Uh, our good friend Laura Brandos brought him up to shout out to Laura Facebook mod. And um, I believe she's still a mod on the, on the subreddit as well. And he simply, Maester Lewin just takes over in, in, in the year 283. So I, I think that's just because Maester Wallace died. He just, his, time, his term ended because he passed. But if not, then it is a mystery. If I'm wrong about that, then what happened to him? Where did he go? Why, why did he leave Winterfell? Because usually they just stay there. You know, that's their job until they die. Or why was he recalled if he was swapped out for some reason? So yeah, it's a potential. And if he did die before, though, that means he, his, his father, if his father is Archmaester 
Walgrave, then he out, the Walgrave outlived him. But Walgrave is like senile now, so we, we don't know what the deal there is. Guilty Undertaker says, did the ultimate question, did Ashara Dane change her name to Gianna and did she marry Helen Reed? Well, uh, second time I've had call to mention Chloe of Girls Gone Canon. That's one of her favorite theories. But uh, personally, I don't think so. But I can't say no. I can't say it's impossible. Ashara Dane is arguably belongs in the missing category. We never found a body. She jumped out the window, we're told, but there's no body. Eh, you know, the body, the, the Pale Stone Sword Tower is over the sea, so we wouldn't expect a body. Yeah. But it's possible she's alive, you know? Yeah, I'd say I'm in the same boat as Aziz in that, you know, I, I just don't buy the theory, really. But I can't fully rule it out. I wouldn't call it crackpot. I wouldn't yeah. go that far, but I wouldn't consider it likely in my own estimation. More than that, I would say I don't want it to be true. Like, <laughs> I don't find great meaning or, like, narrative significance. or I, I don't know. I It doesn't do much for me, so I don't find myself wanting it. If you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I like the tragedy more of her having killed herself. Yeah. I don't like it, but I, I like it on a narrative sense more. So yeah, I don't I know. I think I'm with you there. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's to be clear when I, I say what I think about it. I think it's just I'm looking at what it means for the story to bring it back to what what we cited from Nina to start things off. Why would this character come back? What's the meaning? What's the narrative purpose? And I don't think Ashar is really necessary in order to know John's heritage or anything. We named quite a few characters in this episode alone that can fill that out. Bran, Willa, Richard Lonmouth, Benjen. Yeah, there's a lot of people that might know that. So we don't necessarily need Ashara to be for that. Although, and there's other Danes alive that might know, like uh, Illyria Dane, who was married, who betrothed to uh Beric Dondarrion or were they actually married either it doesn't matter whether they're married or betrothed I think they were just betrothed the point is yeah. she should still be out there you know uh arguably she's considered missing probably not missing though she's probably just at Starfall nothing too strange about that but still she's relevant to this greater discussion about who knows things about the Tower of Joy or the things that came up before it and we will eventually return to this because one of the other topics moot quite uh episodes that was voted on was the abduction of Lyanna so yeah you'll see some of these names come back Sometime in 2024. We do not currently have that one on the schedule, but it will be this year. Next week is Lomas Longstrider. You know, it's an episode that I wanted to do for a long time. I thought I would script it and I had trouble. I've been had trouble writing it. So we're not going to do it as a scripted episode. We're going to do it as a hybrid, partly scripted, partly discussion. And I think it works better as a discussion episode because, well, because there's so many, so many unknowns and just comparisons to the real world. Yeah, just things to throw out and have fun with. So... We're looking forward to that. Hope you are too. Our trivia question today was Rhaegar Frey is the brother of Aegon Frey, son of Aenys Frey. Yeah. And what was the name of his son? Robert. <laughs> it's like he's got a sense of humor. Yeah. He's like, he is named Rhaegar. <laughs> then he named his, he's named after Prince I, Rhaegar and he named his son after the guy who killed his namesake. More than a sense of humor, I think he has a sense of, of desperation to be like, I am not going to be looked kindly upon by this administration. I really need to do anything I can to curry his favor That's and to point. not have him like, like, ugh, Rhaegar Frey, kill him. There's also a Cersei Frey from a different branch. Yeah, yeah. Frey, I mean, so like, it, you speaks, can see. it speaks to the fact that the phrase as a whole for, for multiple generations have just been trying to curry Favor. Yeah, they just blow where the wind is yeah. blowing. Yeah, they like, just do yeah. that. Period. But I think this Rhaegar Frey really needed to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Rhaegar isn't young. That's that's all. St you're right. Like these 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 names were definitely given during the Targaryen era. Like, <laughs> so yeah. But Rhaegar ended up in a pie, despite all his efforts to be on the right side. He ended up in a pie. So you know, that's what happens. And Aenys ended up in a pit, and Aegon is a, a, an outlaw living somewhere. So yeah, other episodes that. Pertain to this one, there's a, so many f connection points made in this one, maybe more than any other episode we've ever done. <laughs> Craster and the Cold Gods, we talked about him in relation to Benjen. We talked about the Golden Company in relation to several missing Blackfires and all that, including Bittersteel and Kala and others. House Dane, episodes one and two, mostly episode one, because that's where we focused on the characters, which gets into you know, Illyria and Edric and some of these others. We talked about Shiera Seastar. We didn't go into too much detail because she has her own episode. The Future of Dunkin' Egg. We had to did a whole episode with Stefan Sasa 
that Sean was a part of, that we went into all sorts of predictions and, and what might happen in the future of that series. It includes a lot of the characters we mentioned today. Our good friend Tommy Pappas came on for an episode called Lost Valyrian Steel, where we discussed characters like Jerrion and Tommen and other characters that uh, were associated with Lost Valyrian Steel items like Aegon's Crown and things like that. Our Victorian Winds of Winter chapter deals with Makoro and the being lost and Euron and the missing ships. Sansa's The Winds of Winter chapter deals with characters like the Mad Mouse and Miranda Royce, who might know who she is, as well as just being a really fun chapter. Mercy, ditto. That's where Raph the Sweetling goes missing because Mer Mercy kills him. And we continue along this strange and curious pattern of Arya's chapters never mentioning the Iron Bank. Uh, we did an episode on Lease, which we also have a mention of Edric Storm, uh, Lara Rogare, and a variety of other characters. We talk about, we have an episode on the Stepstones that includes mention of a lot of these different naval fleets that are relevant now or in the past, including Salador San and Orain Waters. Rob's Will episode, fairly recent one that we talked a lot about Galbert Glover, Mage Mormont, Ned's Bones, and a lot of related topics there, including Howland Reed. Blackfish episode talks about where he might be now, his role in the future of the story. Ditto the clans of the Vale. What might be, what might we see from Shaga and Timmet and in the future? Plus, what about their past? What happened in the past? What about the, the history of the clans and, the, and, and versus the Andals and things like that? We have an episode on dragons that we did during Fire and Blood that gets into a lot of these details and discusses some of these missing dragons in greater context or with different details during their lives. And of course, Dance of the Dragons scripted series with Radio Westeros, where a lot of these characters are mentioned, um, including some of the uh, dragon seeds, like, you know, of course, Nettles, Sheep Stealer, and quite a bit more. Uh, so you can delve in in a lot of places, stay immersed in Westeros, past, present, and future, have a lot of fun. And we appreciate that you do. We, we appreciate your consuming our podcast. We, we appreciate your, your presence and your support. And we we le we need it. We we ha can't exist without it. And if you want to support us financially, go to patreoncom westeros or you can sign up with a Spotify subscription. Same price structure there. We can only do the low. We can only do five dollars subscribers on on uh, Spotify. But we've got bigger options with more perks if you go to Patreon and tell your friends. That's one of the best ways that uh, word of mouth is one of the best ways to spread knowledge of a show. And um, we appreciate that you bring new people in for us. We need it. We can't survive as an independent show without a lot of support. It is a group effort. And oh, we we're saying in terms of community, Aziz is going to a little a Song of Ice and Fire event the last weekend of April in Ohio at Deer Creek Lodge. Not Ice and Fire Con. He's going to the long summer Maiden's Day Festival. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. lots of It's a really small little event, but lots of friends going. And so if you're in Ohio... Uh, whether it's 2024 or not, be, keep in mind often at the end of April, there's an event. So yeah, hit us up if you want more info about it. We can direct you to that where the, uh, the where there you can ask further questions or learn more about it and keep track of it in future years. Thanks to Nina for her invaluable notes. She weighed in on quite a few of the characters here and gave good takes as regards to narrative purpose and potential for characters to reappear. And a happy or belated not. to Nina. It was just yeah, her birthday. That's happy right. Day. Her birthday was Saturday. Today is Sunday. So that's right. Yeah. Happy birthday, Nina. Mm -hmm. Also, thanks to Joey, Jesse, and Bran for the help with our intros. Same goes for Michael Klarfeld. We've got two different versions of our intro. One by Michael Klarfeld, one by Bran, the builder who does our House of the Dragon intro. Joey and Jesse are responsible for our music. And we, yeah, again, it just goes to show how much this is a group effort. Uh, for Ashea, I'm Aziz, and we'll see you next time. You know what to do. Until then, Valar, reread us. Mm -hmm.